baseball is dead. Rest in peace. Where are you right now, Dallas? I am in an Airbnb in Alameda, California. Where is that relative to uh, where <laughs> you're calling a baseball game? You've asked that question literally last week when Dallas told you he was in Air- Alameda. Yep. All right, then answer the question, Joe. You fucking smart ass. It's about, you know, 10 minutes away. A little island. Is it 10 minutes away, a little Dallas? island next to Oakland. Yeah, it's about, give or take, 10 minutes or so away. It's a little island right next to Oakland. Okay. Got it. Yep. <laughs> Why aren't you st- why aren't you staying in Stockton? Isn't that like your thing? Stay at 209, brother. Uh so when, I, when, I, the, when I come home to Oakland, I stay in Stockton, brother. I got I got have, 209 tattooed on my abs. You see it? Anytime or, or Stockton dumb. comes up, I, it's any excuse to lift my shirt up so you can see these abs, brother. You kidding hey. me? 209, kid. Hey, hey, Tony the trucker, are you fucking done? That's All what right. you sound like. <laughs> uh and I'm glad you brought that up because Zach Geloff did, yes, ask to see my abdominal yesterday. I don't think he did. That. Oh, he did. He did. He did. And he was like, uh, I pulled my shirt up and he goes, really? <laughs> and I was like, yeah, that's right. He's like, <laughs> he's like, what the, what the fuck? Yeah, if, if Dallas gets <laughs> fat, that that's going to look so fucking stupid. Dude. <laughs> like the whole life, you can never get fat because everyone's going to see the 209. It's just like. <laughs> that would, Joe, you're right. That would be a very, very bad look. That would hurt the brand. That would mm-hmm. be really bad for the brand. That would actually be very spot on with the brand. Isn't uh, <laughs> isn't Stockton? It's they're they very high years ranking ago. in a lot of that stuff. Was years you don't ago. want to be high ranking in. It's like crime look, illiteracy. It's got to be like fucking, obesity. Look at this kid where does the, one fucking report. He does the, one report where on the city. Stockton ranking six years ago. Obesity. Oh, and that's the one stat you remember. Is that they were third in obesity? Can someone, or whatever the fuck. someone look that up. Stockton is definitely very high ranking in obesity. Yeah, and, and I, I don't see it, frankly. I don't <laughs> see it. <laughs> I mean, maybe it's in my neighborhood where there's just not a lot of uh, overly large people. I don't know. Let's see. Uh, Stockton. Less, not even on the radar. See, You're it's searching. <laughs> Literally searching. I, I looked this shit searching. up when I did the the Bra- Braden video. Tenth and it was most not dangerous hard to find. city in the country. Tenth most dangerous city in the country. Second most dangerous <laughs> dangerous city in the state of California. Trailing only nope. Oakland. <laughs> uh, the, the what third, is as far as the most dangerous city? See, like we're not the, the most third dangerous city least anymore. literate. We're barely a top ten. Oh, here it like, is. Here it is. Here it is. Here it is. Uh, in the 2010 poll, it was revealed that Stockton was tied with Montgomery, Alabama, for the most obese metro area in the country. Buddy, that's with 2010. An obesity that's rate almost, of 346 percent. That's almost 15 years ago. <laughs> They're yes, on their you way guys out. are just been getting fatter. <laughs> Get out of here. No, yeah. that means things have turned around. You just haven't checked back in. That's all. In 2012, Forbes ranked Stockton as the eighth most miserable city in the country, likely due to the crime rates, the obesity, and the unemployment rates, and the people can't read. <laughs> again, again, a very good improvement because they were number one two years in a row. All right. Yeah. yeah. Stockton's See? up and coming. They, they've been saying that. They've been, a, it, uh, the, they've been calling it the city. Austin of California. <laughs> it's an all-American city. You can look it up. All-American yeah. city. Yeah, literally. It's the first, right, it's an all-American it's the city. first city in California that's uh, being rebuilt by millennials, they're saying. Ooh. Yeah, exactly. it's got a millennial touch to it. Silicon Valley is moving to Stockton. I'm, that's... Mm-hmm. There are. Hey, we're telling yeah. you. I'm getting people calling wanting to buy the house fucking daily. <laughs> yeah. Daily. Yeah. Yeah, so that they can condemn it. This episode is sponsored by Knockaround Sunglasses, quality polarized, affordable shades, including new MLB and U.S. Uh, women's soccer team pairs. Check them out at knockaround.com. Um, wow. Welcome back, everybody. It is a, another episode of Baseball is Dead. Today is Wednesday, uh, September 20th. Baseball season, or at least the regular season, is almost over. Some of you may, may be saying, thank God. Thank God for showing us mercy that the baseball season is almost over. Uh, for me, I... I'm in that boat. I think it's a thank God it's over. It's been a it's been another rough year in a in a series of rough years. I I don't really like I'm not miserable. People keep saying like, oh, you must be miserable. Like, no, no, no. I'm I'm very apathetic. Like, I'm very apathetic. I I think um, this season has been one of those years that has uh, snuffed out my passion a little bit. But 
I'm not miserable. I'm not, I, I can't say I'm excited for the future. I'm a little excited, I guess, to see what the Red Sox do this, this offseason. But like someone like Joe, you're a Braves fan. You're on this run of six straight division titles. You're just kind of you. I, we made the comparison before. You're the Patriots fans of Major League Baseball. You're just sitting around waiting for the playoffs. You've been sitting around as, waiting for the playoffs since like the second week of May. Well, that that's the thing, Jared, is as fans of teams who are contending right now, and especially the Braves, mm. Braves fans feel like they've signed like a 12 year deal as a fan. Yeah. You know, like, you know, fans don't really sign deals like that, but they could. And I think they should. And I feel like the Braves are like, you know what? We're rolling with double A. We are as well going to sign ourselves up for 10 more years of this because we're committed. Looks good. Feels good. Uh, we're in a good spot here. So for fans like that, very exciting as well. For fans of teams like the Red Sox and the fans of no, so you teams can't like the, talk, you're a fucking like A's guy. Like you are the well, last person that can well, speak on you, this subject. What's like what, you are you, what are you jumping? What are you, you jumping in on? There's no hope for you. There's no like. There's you, at least some hope for the Red Sox. This this. What are you winter. talking about? But you, you like where? What's your mental state at right now? Because obviously I'm, we're getting a little bit of a glimpse of it. That the only pleasure that you're going to get is by putting down fans of teams that are also not having a good year. But your franchise is the laughing stock of the sport, maybe even professional so I'm sports. So I'm not sure how you took me applauding Braves fans for being able to no, sign no, no, no. You said the Red Sox. A, you said the Red Sox. You, you're trying to put down Red Sox fans. Jake, are you going to take this? Just, just me. Yeah, this is kind of bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's what I'm saying. <laughs> like, this is Mike. Mute his mic, Jake. Yeah, have some, I mean, some fucking mean, respect, Dallas. <laughs> Where are you at right now? I mean, it's been... Probably the most. Would you say that calling the 2023 Oakland A's season was more difficult than any season that you pitched in the big leagues while hurt and not having velocity to begin with? Like, what was more difficult going out there trying to pitch with your shit or sitting through 162 fucking games of the 2023 Oakland A's? Which was more difficult? Well, allow me the freedom, if you will, to phrase it slightly differently. Um, <laughs> What was more mentally taxing? <laughs> it has been one of the greatest challenges of my life. <laughs> to, <laughs> to, yeah, I'm going to be straight up. 2023 has mm -hmm. fucking sucked. Yeah, it yeah. hasn't it hasn't been great. Okay? Have you had any fun besides uh, the reverse yeah. boycott? I've, I've, had, I've, had, I've had a lot of fun at times. I have because tell us a story about a time that you had fun. <laughs> <laughs> this is <laughs> well i mean i got a, i got a great story that I, I i can't name names with uh, okay um you know guys like to get together and, and hang out after the game and you know maybe you get an off day and mm -hmm. you start to explore a little maybe you maybe you get some guys to to experiment and try try some things that maybe they haven't before okay you know? <laughs> and <laughs> And maybe uh, maybe how guys really interact and embrace those opportunities mm -hmm. can can bring about some very, very funny uh, behavior can mm -hmm. bring about some very funny stories. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, we've we've had fun. I've I have I have had my fun. There's mm -hmm. no doubt that I've had my fun this season. Um, and look, I, I've had a uh, I got a guy who spent 30 years in the minor leagues as a broadcaster. Finally yeah. coming up and, and and getting to the big leagues and enjoying that. So how did he get you know, there? I, I've had a lot of uh, hard work, <laughs> grinding, <laughs> dedication, <laughs> hard work. <laughs> you know, yeah. 30, 30 years you've been fucking punching the clock, dude. Yeah, that's a that's a grind. That's so it's, a grind. Yeah. We we've had we've had our fun. We have had our fun. We had a nice little what six seven game winning streak this season. Yeah, you know, and it There's could not have come at a more opportune time. Like that was that was some baseball god type action when that happened. It was beautiful. I mean, we took two out of three from the fucking Brewers, swept the Buccos. It was it was, it was tough. That was a tough one. Harsh I mean, you took it to the Rays players. when the Rays were in God mode. Yeah. Well, and then we came back. You know, the, the Houston Astros here recently had just absolutely undressed the Texas Rangers. I mean, undressed the Texas Rangers. Yeah. And people thought, oh, fuck, we're, we're sending the Oakland A's to Texas right now on a road trip. Like, are we sure we want to do that? Like, they're going to have to come back and finish the schedule. I mean, that's the way that things were going for the Rangers and the Astros. And sure, Rangers took us 
two out of three, punch us right in the mouth. But then the Astros, they're the ones who caught that fucking counter punch. Two out of three from the Astros there. We've had bright spots. But if I'm being serious for just a minute, and I don't want to spend a ton of time on this because they are not good and they don't deserve a ton of attention right now. But for every team and every fan that has watched their team suck at some point in time this season, that has watched their team not live up to expectations, this is the time of the season, and this last month is what it's for, to take stock of where you're headed. And for some organizations, you look at September and you go, I don't want to do that, Dallas, because it sucks now. The future looks like it sucks. I don't I don't want to take stock of where we're at. I want to watch football. Fuck this. I get it. But for Ace fans, you've had a few different guys come up and show you, hey, man, the future can be exciting. And I think A's fans are used to having that sort of feeling at the end of seasons at times. We watched it, and I use the example all the time. Baseball fans know it. Chappie and Ole and Pinder and Canna and Simeon, those guys, you just watch them get better together. And it's early here, but watching Geloff perform the way he has and make the adjustments he has, Ryan Noda, the fucking, you know, this guy's a Rule 5 draft pick who's going to lead rookies in on-base percentage this year. Um, There's just been a lot of things that you can look at and go, you know what? That's going to be interesting to watch next year. I can't wait to see how this kind of unfolds. I'm not telling you that it's going to be a fucking championship run, but damn it, if you can't win 50 games, you got to be excited about the next mix of talent, maybe getting you to 70 or 80. So I think that's where a lot of franchises and a lot of fans are at this time of the season. Yeah. Yeah, it is a unless I mean there there are some good races and you brought it, you brought up the Astros. Did you know that the Astros have a losing record at home? Ooh. Yeah, that that's fucking astonishing. Is that why Did they changed the that? batter's eye? Did you see that? They just changed the batter's eye. Didn't they like add green to it or some shit? I saw that before and after and I was like that is the same picture. That that the is the same. <laughs> what changed? Well, I thought I thought the complaint the complaint was the shade of it and the complaint was that there's also like like in the actual line of sight, just talking to guys, there's just a lot of noise just on the outside of where you're really tracking the ball. You know, like difference in textures and colors and lines and stuff. That's why at Fenway, it looks the way it does. They're not afraid to cover the seats. They'll, you know. Yeah, they do that for day games. I'm sure there's yeah, so, a lot of people listening right now that are probably thinking to themselves, oh, the Astros don't have a fair advantage at home. That's really sad. <laughs> but that we need to move on. We need to move on. We just need to move on. That's a thing of the past. We shouldn't make those jokes about this team. Um, Jay Hay, uh, I feel like I've asked you this before, but you would you would probably identify more as a neutral fan than a Guardians fan in, in at this point. Yeah, definitely. For Your quite mic a while. is muted. Yeah. For okay, quite a while yeah. at this point. Yeah. Um how would you describe your fan experience this year? Like, have you do you feel entertained? Do you feel fulfilled? Or do you feel like as a neutral fan, I feel like that's almost more of an interesting perspective because you're looking at MLB storylines as what's going to excite you versus your own team's performance. Like has Ronald Acuna's season <clears throat> fulfilled you enough to where the Padres and Mets being such a disappointment, like all the storylines in spring training that we were excited about. Has there been more positive than negative? Does 74 to get you hard, Jay? I I think I would say that off the cuff, I've enjoyed this year in ter- purely from a storylines perspective more than I enjoyed last season. Um, okay. I felt like last even with the Judge Otani. Yeah, I I feel like the last season we spent like basically the entire and I know I wasn't with you guys. I mean, the j- broad we royal we spent like the whole time in the second half of the season focused on ex- basically exclusively Judge and Otani and Albert Pujols and yeah like and yeah. those were fun stories and I'm not like I'm those those are not the problem the problem is is that like so much of the focus ended up being on those two things um like if you recall there were not great division races last season um outside of Braves Mets and both of those teams were pretty much always going to make the playoffs under that format. So there was a lot of, there was a lack of drama there. And I just felt like the entire second half last season was a slog storyline wise. I think this season has been way more fulfilling. I think um, I like that the, not to, 
not to like throw it all the way back, but I like that the rule changes that were implemented were successful without being like, like, um, Overbearing. annoying talking points throughout the whole year. Um, like we, we talked about them, we saw how they were implemented, we saw the success and then we moved on. Like the, the one thing I, I do think it's unfortunate that two of the predominant storylines this season ended up being negative things which were the Oakland A's entire situation and lack of success, but more like just the clusterfuck about them moving and ownership. And then the way that Otani season ended and the Angels season situation disintegrated to nothingness, I think was a massive letdown in terms of what were we counting on in the second half of the season to watch, but overwhelmingly positive. I think Um, AL West, AL East, what the Braves have been doing individually to me outweighs the disappointment of not having a Mets Phillies Braves divisional race. I think this is a season where we have to appreciate the Braves historical greatness in that regard. Um, and I, I think the, the NL central while still pretty mediocre overall has provided way more storylines than we ever could have anticipated coming out of that division to start the season, whether it was the pirates kind of mirage fun start at the beginning or the Reds what basically season long push for the p- fringes of the postseason or the Cubs becoming you know relevant and postseason worthy I think sooner than a lot of people anticipated so long answer is uh better than last year and overall positive yeah I totally forgot that in the second half of last year the lead story on Almost every podcast was Aaron Judge versus Shohei Otani. Yeah, it would, even when everything. we like we would start the show and be like, "All right, we're not gonna like no Shohei Otani talk, no Judge debate," and then it would just break out. Like we wouldn't <laughs> yeah. be able. Do, to do you remember it. implement? Do you remember trying bad. to implement a rule where we just couldn't talk about Otani? Just yes. done. Just yes. done. Like we had to. <laughs> People like I was sick of it. The listeners were sick I, of it. I was sick nothing, of it. There's nothing I that didn't could want to stop it. There's and, nothing that could stop it. Like you would just say something. That would remind you of Shohei Otani or Aaron Judge, and they'd be like, "Yeah, about that MVP race, though." And yeah. then next thing you know, you're you're 20 minutes down the road debating the fucking American League MVP in like I don't know mid August. And my problem was less that, and not specific to the podcast, but just generally, my my problem was less that it came up all the time, and more that it just seemed to suck the energy out of every other conversation, and that I don't think the sport was providing those conversations in the same way that they did in 20 like you go back to 21 and that was the year like where you had like this wave of young talent 20 and 21 was wave of young talent like ready to take over the game right like that was Mm -hmm. it was tatis it was vlad jr it was like yes um soto and soto like yeah we could keep naming all these people but like it was supposed to be like that was the excitement of that season and that's what drove 21 and i just felt like for as individually great as those seasons were and like the home run chase, I did enjoy it. Uh, even if it was just the AL home run record. Um, but I do think it became too much of the conversation and became fatiguing by the end. Yeah. Yeah. You never want to have a story get so beaten into the ground that by the time you get the end result, it's not like, Yay, like Aaron Judge finally got the record or yay, Shohei Otani won the MVP. It's like, thank fucking God that's over so everyone can shut the fuck up about it. Like that's that's where I was that's, by the time we got there. Well, that's and where that's it was. The nice thing, and that's been the nice thing about this. And I think the most contentious or, or interesting award race this year is NL MVP. It's the one we've spent the most time talking about. But the nice thing about that debate conversation is that it really saved itself for the final six weeks of the season. Right. And we didn't Mm. like, I don't, if if this, if this, it wasn't some, yeah. And if Betts Acuna went on for another month would probably get a little tiresome too. But I, I think those two camps last year were so entrenched into who they felt was the MVP that I felt like it was just two people or two groups talking past each other. A lot of the time, Whereas, just yelling at each other. Yeah, whereas Acuna bets, or if you want to extend it even further, I think it's more about Dream. nuance, and there maybe is no wrong, outright wrong answer, even if you feel passionately about one side. I just, I don't think you can engender that sort of, like, like stuck-in-the-mud attitude about this MVP race, that or any award race this year that you could about last year. Well, so, so then I'll, I'll say, oh, go ahead, Joe. I was just saying the way Acuna's playing. 
seems like it might be that if you're picking Mookie at this point, you know, might as well just like put up the well. I'm see, there's nothing to say. And this Mookie, is where- Mookie being able to say that he has a chance, legitimately, that argument lasted for maybe 48 hours. Like there was a 48 hour window where you were like, well, I don't know, and then it shifted right back to Acuna almost. Well, and that's what I said. Well, and it, it happened all year with, with Corbin at first, and then it was Freddie, and then it was Mookie. Mm-hmm. And each time there's a, a guy comes up to the play, I'm going to fight Acuna in the death battle. I'm going to beat the final boss. And Acuna the, said, I will fucking, I'm faster than you. And I, and I have no issue with the 4070 being the thing that pushes the narrative for Ronald Acuna Jr. Because we saw it, you just said it, Jay Hay with Judge and the home runs. Like, that was the leg to stand on. I mean, there's a lot of other offensive statistical categories that Aaron Judge was leading in that made it really almost like a non-argument. But I think we have to address it. Shout out to Shohei for making it easier this time on everybody. He's like, look, I'll just put together a 10-win season and I'm going to sit out the last month. All right? And then you guys can you guys can argue all you want. You can yell all you want. You can fuck. Whatever. I, Just ship the fucking trophy. You know the address. <laughs> we'll see you in spring training. I, know the, yeah. I saw somebody on Twitter trying to make a case for Corey Seager while misspelling Corey. <laughs> Uh, like a blue check mark at like radio person. And I was just like, can we, will we ever have one season where we just don't do this? Where, yeah. where nobody like, feels what about, no, yeah, it, we, some, we just don't need to do it this year. No, no, we don't. <laughs> it's laughable. It's legitimately but, laughable. But his batting average with runners in scoring position, doesn't that on Tuesdays? Doesn't that mean <laughs> something to you? I respect it though to go after the show base like that. You are inviting a wave of crazy mentions mm-hmm. of yeah. just Japanese I characters, and yeah, I you're saw, getting attacked it. for making like, such Max- a stupid thing. When Max was on on Monday, he like jokingly took jabs at Shohei and then some Shohei fan account like quoted it and they were attacking the podcast. They were attacking Max. It was crazy. I was like, bro, I think what, like one of the ways that it was written. Max, um, Max could uh, be the hurdle for us in Japan, Jared. That's true. <laughs> that's true. Um, so it was like, you know. Don't you fact check because they were talking about how like Shohei went back to Japan. Like, obviously, oh. he didn't do that. Uh, he's like, does this podcast fact check anything? It's like, don't do you fact check the podcast to Us? see that like he was clearly joking? Like, Jesus Christ. I mean, I saw foul territory hit a hot one on that. They said Shohei was in Japan and boom. Yeah, that's the thing. One Shohei account, the wrong Shohei account retweets you. You're fucked. It's two straight yeah. days. <laughs> Of yeah. a thousand, uh, <laughs> and they're in Japanese. A lot of them. I don't even know how they're reading it. And you're getting you're getting flamed for two days straight. Yeah, at least, mm-hmm. at least. <clears throat> yeah, I don't know. That's um, he's uh, he's got quite the. I don't want to say polarizing. What's the word I'm looking for? Rabid. Yeah, he's got a rabid fan base. He's got a rabid fan base. Where Maniacal. I don't think that there's ever been anything like that, maybe since Griffey, in at least in baseball, where you kind of have like that LeBron James effect, where it's like, I'm not a Cavs fan. I'm not a Lakers fan. I'm a LeBron fan. And I follow LeBron and I well, watch and root for whatever team LeBron's on. Like Shohei has that. And it's it's basically just baseball fans in Japan. But then there's also the Dallas Bradens and Ben Verlanders are the same person uh, of the world that just like you know, love Shohei no matter what team he's on. This this dude has done something that <laughs> you're so fucking proud of yourself. This this team or this dude has done something that I mean, his own teammates have acknowledged. Right. They said, like, look, dude, when we come out to get on the bus. There's there's people and there are women, there are young girls, there are old men yelling this dude's name, screaming, waving like he's a fucking rock star, like he's Michael Jackson, like he's the fucking Beatles. And it, it feels like there hasn't been another example that fans are able to latch onto and kind of compare to because of what the Beatles was like when they showed up here stateside. But when you have people waiting outside your hotel and outside your bus, and uh, I forget who it was that we were talking to, there was like, dude, these people are crying. These people are like openly weeping when they see Otani. 
Griffey was not creating that kind of energy. That no. was not that kind of buzz. Okay. They loved him. You might have had the guy in accounting wearing his fucking hat backwards on <laughs> Friday after lunch. That might have been a thing, but <laughs> they, they didn't. They were not waiting for that dude to hop off the fucking D train or wherever and shower him with adulation. That was not a thing. Otani's but basically the, uh, the baseball Taylor Swift. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. It's basically, it goes yeah. Swift, Otani in terms of worldwide superstars probably yeah yeah and as far as the people that will take up and defend him very swifty esque <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> the otanis it's the show base like the swifties the show base the show, the, show base. the show base they will defend him to the end of the earth and uh i feel like a lot of that is is earned i think if, if you're if i mean no disrespect to the foul territory guys if you saw that video of him getting off the plane in the airport <laughs> in japan and thought that was real like come the fuck it, on it looked like it was shot in 1998 yeah, yeah. <laughs> it was like there was maybe six pixels involved in that video yeah and, I, and i'm sorry but if i like i don't know when that was i don't care if that was three weeks ago it still feels like there's going to be a thousand more people and they're going to be losing their shit if they saw otani after what has transpired and there's going to be way more angles of it like people are going to know, like, oh, man, Shohei came back. I mean, I guess we're on the topic of Shohei. We might as well talk about it. Skip to this story. Um, Shohei Otani getting the uh, surgery, the statement from his agent. Shohei had his procedure this morning at Curlin and Job Orthopedic Clinic in Los Angeles, which is not in Japan. That Been is in there. California. <clears throat> the final decision and type of procedure was made with a heavy emphasis on the big picture. Shohei wanted to make sure the direction taken gave him every opportunity to hit and pitch for many more years to come, um, said Neil Alcatraz, uh, MD. El- Elitraj. Same thing. Uh, <laughs> who performed the procedure, quote, the ultimate plan after deliberation with Shohei was to repair the issue at hand and reinforce the healthy ligament in place while adding viable tissue for the longevity of the elbow. I expect full recovery. And he'll be able to hit without any restrictions come opening day of 2024 and do both hit and pitch come 2025. Shohei is resting and in good spirits and excited to be on the road to recovery. Uh, but this nowhere in this does it say that it was Tommy John Tommy surgery. John? So this is that uh, that like elbow brace thing that they were talking about. Yeah, um, I think initially. Your thoughts are, well, why wouldn't he do everything that he can do and the doctors do everything they can do to put him in a position to be able to do what he's done up until this point, which is pitch and hit again. This all just goes back into the conversation about if he's able to recover, who's willing to take on that kind of um, program, that kind of schedule for the near future. Because I think you have to look at this as a two-year project and or a, a two-year occurrence where you're you're going to get him back at some point, and he's going to be vile, viable offensively. And then how do you start to weave him in to the program on the mound? And how does that start to reveal itself? Because at some point in time, if Otani is hitting in the middle of your lineup, that's great. You're excited about that. But at some point, Tom, at some point in time, Shohei Otani is also, Tom. Going, he's also going to have to go on a rehab assignment of some sort. Or is he? So mm-hmm. that's where it gets interesting because do you want to have this guy hitting for you every day? And then before the game, is he working through his progression? So today would be a start day for him. But instead of him being in, let's say, Las Vegas, let's put him on the A's just because that's the affiliate I know right away. Let's put him in Vegas. N- no, I don't know if you do that. You, you, you start him. Right, he's he's my DH. Can we take him to Vegas and and let him pitch and miss out on having him hit for us? Like, how do they work that out? So maybe it's something where they create a hybrid opportunity where he can get that work done at the big league stadium wherever he's at, so he can still be there for them offensively. I mean, that's like think about that road to recovery. If they they had to do that, they would ship in players and pay them like full salaries just to 
fake fake games well, just to rehab Shohei because he's worth that much. They'll just well, what, what you do, guys. what you do, Joey. Like I'm, this is what happens. All right, and this is what happens in L.A. because they're close. Rancho Cucamonga's right there. <laughs> you from A ball? You're going to come over to the ballpark today because Clayton Kershaw needs to throw four to five innings worth of a sim game, and you will be the dudes he faces. All right, so we'll see you here at the Ravine uh, around one o'clock. And that's what those kids get to do that day. Instead of playing in the big leagues, they get to go to the big league ballpark and face Clayton Kershaw. They're not going to play in the game. Maybe they play in the game. Maybe they're able to get back to Rancho in time. But that's how that kind of stuff works. They take guys from the spring training facility. Hey, we got this guy out here right now. He's going to be there for four days. He's going to be off the mound twice in those four days. You need to go see him. Mm -hmm. Well, I don't think that's obviously probably not going to happen if he's coming back in 2025. Just going to build up in spring training like a regular season. Yeah. Alex Cora will figure it out. He's got a plan. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) I think he'll figure it out. We don't know who the general manager is going to be. I don't want to see you do this to yourself. I don't want to see you. Maybe it's Mike Hazen. Um, because I'm gonna have no choice but to enjoy it. Derek Hall said, "Fuck off!" Didn't you see that about Mike Hazen? Yeah, he said that, that like they haven't talked yet. Said he would, but probably it's like, say no. Yeah, but who gives a fuck? <laughs> That's negotiations. That's just a little bit of hardball. You yeah, know? they're All trying right. to they're trying to get a Mike Avilas out of the deal. It always happens. Or hey, about Derek Jeter's a free agent. Ooh. You want Jeets running the Sox? Hey, I think Jeets didn't get a fair shake in Miami. I think he's the type of guy. I agree. Who- Imagine Jeets takes over the Red Sox, and the first thing he does is like, that big wall is dumb. <laughs> Take it down. <laughs> Make it the same size all the way around. Just back it up. Stupid. Ted Williams seat paints it blue. Yeah, and no more facial hair, boys. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no more facial hair. Yeah. Fires Alex Cora, hires Joe Torrey. I mean, is is it let me ask you guys this though. Is anybody else does that even has that even come across your radar like how the Otani recovery is going to be handled? Like cuz the conversation has been are you prepared to handle Otani at his healthiest and what that could bring as far as moving guys around, roster construction, rotation, things like that. Completely healthy. It is a work that has to be paid attention to and heavily assessed and planned for. If he's making every start and taking all of his at-bats, you have to gear up for that. Now you're talking about a dude who can do both and can do one while he's recovering from the other. So how do you match that up during a season where you need him in the lineup today, but today is also a day that he needs to throw a bullpen slash potentially give you three, four ups and downs because that's where he's at in his recovery. Or do they just say, look, by the time he starts to have to pitch three, four plus innings, he's going to go on his rehab and he's going to hit when he pitches for that team and he's going to stay there and he's going to hit for that team tomorrow as well. And it's like, oh, okay. So this is where when it's a double-edged sword, you got to entertain the other edge. And the other edge here is you could have Shohei Otani the DH and not be able to use him. Because you also have Shohei Otani, the pitcher, and that guy has to rehab. Well, isn't that the reason why they're saying 2025 for pitching? Like, I don't know the surgery, but if it's not Tommy John, I'm thinking there's probably a good chance if he was just a pitcher, he could probably pitch at the end of next year. Well, that's that's I, I think this could be a situation where they're saying, like, you know, Tommy John, depending on where you're at, uh, health-wise, the extent of the injury, blah, 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 blah. I, I think on average now, we're talking about a 16 to 18 month window. We've seen guys like for pitchers, we've seen guys come back a lot sooner than that, no doubt. But I think on average, that's where the safety play is. And so if that's the case for Otani, you know, hey, we're not even entertaining him getting to a point where he has to pitch and we have to worry about that. But he didn't get Tommy John. I I read an article earlier, I can't find it, but they were saying the surgery he got is supposed to be, it was the same surgery as someone else got it. It was the same surgery as Trevor Story. It's Trevor on his elbow yeah. with the speed brace, kind of like they did with uh, with Aaron Rodgers 
Achilles? They put like a speed brace on it? I don't know, but I don't know. They were comparing it to Trevor Story. They said he'd be able to get back faster before Trevor Story. I'm not really sure how fast Trevor Story got back and how long that took. But didn't he get? Didn't Trevor Story get surgery like before the season, right in spring training? Um, no. Uh, it was kind of like in the middle of the winter. Um, let's see. Uh, yeah, it was January 10th, and so he came back in what July, August, uh, August. <clears throat> yeah, I don't, that was really weird. Like he. Was he going to play maybe in the World Baseball Classic or something? Like he was starting to get ramped up to play for Team USA. Like he he definitely needed the surgery last year. Didn't get it at the start of the offseason. I think he started to attempt to get ramped up for the WBC, felt something in his elbow, and then got the surgery in like the second week of January. Mm. And then came back in August. So well, eight months-ish. Either way, Trevor Story is not a pitcher, so the timeline is probably going to be a lot longer for someone who has to pitch with it. Yeah, I, I just what I hope what I hope does not happen. What I hope we don't see happen is Otani find a find a home, and before he's able to really settle in and become the dude that you would want him to become in this new place, which you hope would be probably for the remainder of his career here, that they start to run into issues where they're unable to get on the same page with his rehab. They're unable to get on the same page with how he's going to be used because maybe there's been a setback in his rehab. And now everything that we were so excited about Otani with starts to take a back seat because of the, you know, ugly business side of how this dude's going to be handled and where he's at in his recovery. Like, I don't want the next three years to be, you know, uh, just a grind on TV, like MLB network. Just here's the story. Where's Otani in the recovery? Can't believe team X decided to do this and like it just I it just seems like it's an opportunity for it to get awfully messy and awfully muddy. I don't want that. Boston has some of the best hospitals in the world. <clears throat> so <laughs> and that's what you need coming off of surgery and rehabbing. You need to go to the hospital every day, get your long toss in, weighted balls. You want to go to the hospital for that because they are the best doctors <laughs> in the world and Boston's a great place to do that. Yep. I agree. Yep. And coming to me for all your baseball picks is also a great place to be because once again, I hit. Uh, I'm pretty sure no one else did. Um, did anyone else hit? Whoa, no? I did not. Whoa, I yeah. did. I did. You did, Jay? Hey? Oh, congrats. Welcome to the island of relevancy. Um, <sighs> Dallas still waiting to get there. Joe still waiting to get there. Yeah, <clears> I mean, l- let's be honest. Adam Wainwright had the game of his fucking season. Okay. The one game. You don't think the that maybe one. there was a little bit of motivation to win his 200th game and that, you know, maybe that wasn't a smart pick? Or? I think you had yeah, it right the another- first time. You were like, let's go with the Cardinals and Adam Wainwright. I'm taking the Brewers. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you, 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 said, you said it. Maybe it's actually all due respect to Jake. Maybe he misinterpreted your pick. Yeah, yeah. maybe. That, you know what? I think that's a good way to look at that, Jay. Because it was yeah. pretty obvious what the pick was going to be. Mm-hmm. And then, so, like, your brain, Jake- your brain just went <laughs> like, yeah. <just, laughs> I'll let it slide. Well, what happened is I got caught up in the way Freddie Peralta has been pitching lately. That's, that's yeah, what did yeah, it for yeah. me. And I was like, yeah, Wayno thinks that 200 is going to happen right now. Freddie Peralta is going to come in and be the fucking nightmare. Mm-hmm. Like, I didn't, that's kind of where I was at with that. Yeah, All the Ad- numbers told me. Yeah, that Adam Wainwright. Oh, a bird. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yep. It's terrible. Um, anyways, I, another win for me. Bunch Peralta of L's pitched, for everyone else. Peralta did pitch great. Uh, no, did, I, 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 I just need, yeah. My, I, I, Adam I got, Wainwright just literally had the best start of his fucking season. Seven innings of shutout baseball for Wayno. His last start ever, he wins 200 games. Shuts, I mean, tip of the cap. I'm not angry. I was happy. I was happy to not have won that bet for the sake of Adam Wainwright. Did he announce that he's done? Like he, he wanted to go out with that start? I don't know that he's announced that. I don't know why he would have to announce that, but I don't know why he would take the ball again. Okay. Well, I mean, you just worded it as if like that was a thing. Because I am, I am speaking outwardly for Adam. You're Wainwright. making that decision for Adam Wainwright. You're yes, telling him his career is over. Old yellow yeah, ring te- Adam Wainwright. Yeah. <laughs> yes, I'm. T- I'm telling Wayno, buddy. You just dialed up seven shut. Okay. You haven't hit 86 in a year. <laughs> like let's 
I love you. I love everything you've done for this game. I love you as a leader for this game. I love you as an ambassador for the future of this game, which is why I want you to go out with the feeling of seven shut in your mouth and not a feeling where you're being dragged off the mound after two and a third because you gave it everything you had to get to 200 last time, and everybody knows that, wow. and now you're out there on fumes. I don't want that to happen. Ring, ring, Adam. It's the glue factory. That's basically what <laughs> Dallas is saying right now. <laughs> mm-hmm. That's hey. it. I, I got no problem. Adam, this is Elmer. Uh, <laughs> He's got a country is. album coming out. He's probably calling some playoff games. He needs to prepare for other shit, you know? God, I bet that's yeah. a good album. Hey, can't, cannot wait. You think that we're not going to get the Adam Wainwright Joe West <laughs> fucking duo. You think we're not getting that? Oh, we're getting that. That sound, are those absolute. sounds better not reach my ears. <laughs> we are getting that. If I think I can you, successfully stay away. I can't wait. Somebody send me the flyer of their first live show because I'll fucking go. Uh. <laughs> Honestly, <sighs> you would have to pay me. <laughs> I'm going to pay you if you hit some of these bets, Jay Hay. Because things are heating up in the ballpark. Every team is playing to finish the season strong and make it to the playoffs. With DraftKings Sportsbook, you won't miss a moment of the baseball action. I'm just happy that we have baseball reads again instead of football. New customers can score $200 instantly in bonus bets for betting just $5 on baseball. Plus, all customers can take a crack at a sweet payday with DraftKings Same Game Parlays. String together multiple bets from a single game for your shot at a major payout. So what are you waiting for? Download the DraftKings Sportsbook app right now. Use the promo code Jared, J-A-R-E-D. New customers can score $200 instantly in bonus bets for betting just $5 on baseball. Only on the DraftKings Sportsbook with the promo code Jared. The crown is yours. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER in Massachusetts. Call 800-327-5050 or visit gambling help line ma.org in new york call 877-8-HOPE-NY or text hope ny in kansas call 1-800-522-4700 on behalf of boot hill casino and resort 21 plus in most eligible states but age varies by jurisdiction eligibility restrictions apply see draftkings.com sportsbook for details and state-specific responsible gambling resources bonus bets expire seven days after insurance Opt-in and 10-plus leg requirement for 100% boost. Eligibility, wagering, and deposit restrictions apply. Terms at sportsbook.draftkings.com slash baseball terms. Threw another parlay out today. That's probably going to hit. They usually do. It's a juicy one. Got my boy Mookie in there. Future National League MVP. Little Yandy Diaz action. Mm -hmm going on and i was actually gonna go cubs money line because uh justin Steele is pitching against the pirates but then i saw the last time that mitch keller pitched against the cubs uh he went eight shut mm. so i was like all right maybe i'll stay away from that one you don't want that <clears throat> no i really don't yeah I but jared don't. jared 8.33 yes. era for mitch keller over his last five road starts Ooh, is one of those was one of those road starts that uh, eight earn run performance against the Braves? Yes. Oh, a lot of conflicting stats. What are you going to do? I'm saying I feel like, you know, anytime the Braves are the reason why a pitcher's numbers may be inflated, you got to take that with a grain of salt. Mm. You got to take it with um, a grain of salt. Before we, uh, I'm, I'm going to have to take off here soon. And before I take off, I wanted to draw some attention Two. to that National League Cy Young race. Oh, well, Blake Snell action over here. Mm-hmm. Okay. I mean, what you saw last night, how many, how many turns these guys got left after last night? One, maybe two? Yeah, maybe two turns. Well, they've got well, yeah. Let's say two because it's about twelve games. Because that's what Manny yeah. Machado kept saying. All right, like <clears throat> not to skip ahead, um, because I don't think that you're going to be here for that discussion. But the the Athletic also dropped a piece on the culture of the clubhouse. It. Let's get into it with the Padres. And Manny was answering questions about it at his locker. And this fucking guy, 
He keeps like, they're like, well, you know, like any comment on the clubhouse culture? It's like, well, we got 12. We're playing our best baseball right now. We got like a winning streak going. We got 12 games left. I'm like, bro, you're 20 games out. Like, what are you talking about? Like, mm-hmm. I, I don't know why he keeps talking about like like his response to it is how many games the Padres have left and how that's a good thing. And they like he's talking like he the, he can the Padres control their own destiny. Like, <laughs> bro, answer the question. Like, what are you talking about? You have 12 games well, left. Like, why do you keep saying that's that? the non-answer? That's the non-answer. That's him just answering that, like, okay. So what you do in that situation, Jared, is you wait for the you wait for the person who's asking the questions to follow up with an intelligent follow-up. Or one that would call out what you just said, yeah, which would sound something like, well, "No, that's that's a great point, Manny." But does the idea that you're playing good and don't have anything to play for mean anything? Yeah, I guess. Oh. I mean, remember that time when Jonathan Papa, then, when Papabon fought Bryce Harper, and <laughs> they kept asking Bryce Harper, "Why the fuck did you get choked out by Jonathan Papabon?" He's like, "Yep, we got six games left," and said it seven times in a two minute span. <laughs> just focus on the next six games. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> just focus on the next six games. See, there you go. That's what is it going to say? If what you just ignore say? it, it will go away eventually. Eventually, people will stop asking Bay Machado why he's a piece of shit. Eventually, eventually. Just, I, 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 just I just it. don't. I don't see. I don't see that clubhouse. I, I believe that clubhouse is beyond repair. That's what the anonymous source said about AJ Preller's relationship with Bowmel. And unfixable that, that was uh i and if you did you i don't know if you saw bomel's response to a question regarding his relationship with aj preller and he said look you know well i think we're fine but look you're gonna disagree you're not always going to agree on things and you know healthy conflict is good because out of conflict comes solutions we have to put our heads together and figure out how to work past these things. So you'd like to think that those words you hear from the manager and maybe from AJ Preller or from someone in his camp or whatever could lead you down a path that says, front office wise, we can't get on the same page. It's been a trying year and we need to figure out and assess how we are looking at this room collectively as a front office, which does include our manager. How are we looking at this room and this group of people? And if we're looking at them through different lenses, well, then here, maybe try mine on and let me try yours on and let me see if I can see what you're seeing. And once that has happened and we still can't see eye to eye and we're still not seeing the same stuff, well, now we probably have to have a discussion about how, how do we make this better for everybody involved. And if that means moving on, then maybe that means moving on. But yeah. Bob Melvin said, and he said this to me and he said this to the media if there is any thought about there not being cohesiveness or there not being any sort of positive leadership in that clubhouse, well, then that's going to fall on me first because I'm the manager and I'm the one who's supposed to be able to cultivate that or I'm the one who's supposed to be able to have an impact on that. And I agree with that to an extent, but at a certain point in time, the manager cannot be held solely responsible for how you interact with your teammates. And how you go to work every day. And if that is impacting the climate in the room and the manager is on the outside of that, what would you have him do? Set up a tea party for you guys to get together? What would you have the manager do? Because you have to realize you have four guys who we've talked about who are middle of the bat orders, star power galore, that would be enough to shine for any one organization, any one of those dudes, Tatis. Machado, Soto, Bogey, who just hit his second career walk-off last night. Any one of those dudes on any other team is the fucking guy. And now you got four of those dudes who are trying to figure out what level of the guy they are in this room, in this group, right? Does Soto bow down to Machado and to Tatis and to Xander because he's the young one? Or is he the one looking at them going, Buddy, I was the dude who this franchise had built around, and then I got moved over here because the franchise you're a part of wants to keep me here forever. And they like you. Great. You're 10 years in, signed up. So next, who else do I got to talk to? And that's where those guys are looking at him going, you're right. I'm going to be here for 10 years. So is he? So you need to fall the fucking line. Like, how does that work itself out? I think that has been the issue, and I don't know that that has a positive ending coming. The athletic article to me 
to follow up on the San Diego Tribune article was interesting in that it just extended the blame upward, right? Whereas the Union Tribune article focused on Machado as kind of the problem here. I I think the athletic, assuming their reporting is correct, really shed some important light on this, which is that, in my opinion, after reading both of these articles, Machado is a very small part of the problem. And really, even if you were to swap him out for somebody equally as talented, which is not going to happen, I don't think this problem would be addressed organizationally at all because the athletic nope. seems to pin it primarily on AJ Preller, um, which is several levels above Manny Machado in the decision making department, obviously. And th- there are some really, listen, I don't know AJ Preller, obviously, n- none of us here do, but it's, there are some red flags for me in terms of some of the quotes that were provided or the ideas that Preller pushes were provided like forget the the weird employee stuff and like what does that weird guy from the rugby stuff do here that's whatever the philosophy of do more than anybody else at all times i've known these people i think we all have and they can be brilliant at what they do but that does not mean that they are good motivators of people and nor does it mean they're good leaders of organizations and i think the more time passes with aj preller having been the primary decision maker for the Padres, the more clear it is that this is a man who is extremely talented at uh, assessing talent and developing talent at a minor league level up to and through the major leagues and much less talented perhaps at leading an entire organization and setting a cultural tone because this stuff is uh, micromanager was another thing that was, that was brought up wants wants to do hands on approach wants to do things differently um gets in the way obsessed uh and and some of those things can be good when directed in the right way or in the right role but president of baseball it, operations or gm just might not be that role if you're really talking about a culture set and that's what this article seems to be no the, the, and there's there's a difference in approach where if you know what you know and you know that you you hear stay in your lane how many times so you can be aggressive and you can want to have the baseball conversations even if you don't have the acumen to back it up and what you need to have shortly thereafter quickly thereafter is the ability to acknowledge that and empower the other people to make those decisions so it would look something like this hey i really like this guy I think he matches our group. I think he can fit with what we're trying to do analytically. There might be some platoon addition here. What do you guys think? And that's me talking as AJ Preller. And then his baseball group might look at him and go, look, AJ, we actually, we've got this guy and we've been thinking about this dude and this is how it works. And this is where the numbers fit in. And AJ would then go, oh, you know what? I get it. You know what? That makes it, that makes a lot of sense. I can see why you guys see that. Or AJ might go, that's great, but I really like this guy right here. So let's bring this guy in, and then that's where the where the circuits start to get crossed. That's where things start to go awry. And because that is another that was another conversation, Jay. That was like, look, just don't know that this guy knows well enough to leave well enough alone. And you know, I this is probably further down on the, on the blame situation, but specific to the Melvin Preller thing. One of the things in this article that I found interesting was the lack of roster flexibility that Pre- Preller had provided Melvin throughout the season in terms of ability to manage. And I can't say that I was thinking a lot about um, the number of backup reserve players, position players on the Padres roster day to day and week to week. But, you know, if you're talking about like, what do the what do the Dodgers do well or what are some or what are the Rays doing well it's not necessarily having the most talent right we've talked about it it's platooning it's having a steady flow of talent to cycle in day to day so that over 162 these guys aren't burned out by the end of the season and that's a small thing but it is like in terms of relationships between GM and and manager like if you already have a personality difference and you're hamstringing your manager's ability to manage, which is the exact opposite of his relationship with Billy Bean and the Oakland front office when he was at Melvin's, that is, when he was in Oakland, mm-hmm. then you can see how the friction would would play out that way. Well, and, and think about this. 
Think about how they're set up just on the infield. Okay. And what had to happen? Who's playing shortstop? Conceivably, the only guy that they could trust to play shortstop. Is that how some people look at it? Well, think about who's playing second base. Ha Song Kim. Well, he Pretty should be playing shortstop. shortstop. Pretty good shortstop, Jared. Yeah. Pretty good shortstop. Yeah. But why can't he play shortstop? Because you've got a guy there who can only play shortstop. Well, well why Bogarts, can't that- Bogarts, they said they're going to move to first base. But you know who you got over at first base? A guy by the name of Jake Cronenworth. And why is he over at first base? Because you got a guy by the name of Ha Song Kim playing second base. Why is he playing second? Because <laughs> Xander's playing short. Why is Xander playing short? Because Manny's playing third. Where are you going to put these fucking guys? Yeah. Manny, guys. I mean, That's the, the lack of flexibility. I, I'm not going to hammer it into the ground because I feel like we, we've talked about this in previous Padres discussions, but I think the Jake Cronenworth contract is the most puzzling out of all the <laughs> contracts that they, this and, team has given and, out. And, and, let's and everyone wants to say the Bogarts contract is the worst. No one ever talks about the Cronenworth contract. Like, What did he ever do to deserve that? And how is he doing a single thing to and, justify it? And, and let's not forget, they took their all-star, star-studded, perennial gold glover they were hoping for. That guy's playing right field now. All right, and he might be the best right fielder in baseball in terms of defensive run saved. He's oh. knocking on the door of thirty. So that's the kind of lack of roster flexibility, I guess you could point to. And then you talk about depth, guys behind him. Let's remember Nelson Cruz was playing baseball for this team. Hmm. He was. I, I just, I just yeah. also think like. You know, you have Bob Melvin's track record and you have AJ Preller's track record. And if AJ Preller, it says in the article, if he's permitted to hire another manager, it would be his sixth in 10 full seasons. Um, and we know the sort of stability that Bob Melvin presided over in previous relationships. And I know how many, decade, how many manager of the year was he? Three? Three? Green and three. gold. Yeah, three. Three, three manager of the year. Manager you can't, the year. If you can't win with Bo Melvin, you can't win. Uh, yeah, I just. Yeah. I, the one last year. There, can you guys recall an instance where so many people were were opening up? I mean, off the record, obviously, but were opening up about a team in two different articles so close together that just like basically blasted the whole organization, like all the yep. all the main players. What is it? The Red? Yep. Yeah. The, the Red, Red Sox. 12 Red Sox. Yeah. yeah. That was the only one that came Every, to mind Everyone me. was fucking talking off the record, but on the record. Chicken and beers, but, baby. Yeah. Chicken and beers. Yeah, fuck Bobby Valentine. <laughs> this guy sucks. Fuck this team. Yeah. yeah. No, I remember that. That Why, was the only one that came to mind, honestly. <laughs> yeah. And that's what this vibe is like right now is everybody is feeling the weight of this season and feeling the weight of the disappointment and the lack of success. And they're like, you know what? I think at this point, we've got a pretty good idea of why it isn't working and why it hasn't worked. So instead of sticking our heads in the sand and acting like we don't know, give us that anonymous option and I'm a fucking let it eat. <laughs> so there's a mute. There's a the mutiny against AJ Preller. The team is taking down the GM. That's what I'm hearing. Um, kind of, I mean, well, I mean, Dallas, you just said that you, this team, you don't think there's any way that this team could ever like exist how it is. I don't. So like what, what is it? The players, is it the front office? Is it ownership? Like what would, what would you do to change that? So like you have to get rid of something, do something different, get rid of someone. If, if the, if the relationship between the GM and the manager is a rocky one, that makes for a, a difficult and a strenuous working environment because everybody now feels the stress and the strain of that relationship and everybody kind of knows that there's no seeing eye to eye there. And so there's turbulence. And now every decision made starts to have a cloud hanging over it or starting to loom because you're wondering, why was that decision made? He doesn't even like him. They don't even get along. Who's making this fucking decision? Why did it work out that way? And you just, you don't want that. To Jay Hayes' point, that was never a vibe in Oakland with Bob Melvin, ever, ever. Just, just to bring it, I, I'm mad now. Just to bring it back to the Machado thing, and I'm, I'm the San, the Union Tribune article now bothers me in a way it didn't before because I've been thinking about the Machado angle and I've been reading this article this morning and like they make the point that while Machado might be not be a rah rah leader 
in the very very stereotypical, generally white mm -hmm. sense of the of the word, right? That we think of. Yep. He is yep. second in the major leagues since what 2015 in games played, only to Paul Goldschmidt. Okay. And I think there is a va there is undoubtedly a value and a leadership style that involves playing every fucking day and playing through what are undoubtedly nagging injuries that he's absorbing as a high end elite infielder throughout mm -hmm. that entire time. S kind of separately, um, whether or not he is a good leader when it comes down to it, I don't want to fucking hear it as the reason for why this team isn't, isn't leading up to expectations from people inside of the Padres, because you had two heads up that this is how Manny Machado was. You had to have known given his reputation, what he was like before you signed him to the initial large deal. And if you didn't know, you had the opportunity for four seasons to get to know him before you rewarded him with yet another massive extension on top of that. So if you are dissatisfied with his leadership style or approach, that is fucking on the front office and on the ownership group, period. Why do you think they got and Nelson Jay, hey. Cruz? The, hey, hey, Joey, God damn it! you just took the words out of my mouth. Because what happens when you are a casting director, right? You're in charge of putting together a group of people who can act and behave and create in a way that is so believable, it's going to blow your fucking socks off, right? Silver screen, here we come. And when those people don't match up, the project falls flat. It falls right on its face. Look, no, for, I don't want to say that Moneyball fell on its face. It did not. Successful. But I don't think that Philip Seymour Hoffman was the guy for Art Howe. I just don't think that was the case. So, and RIP Philip Seymour Hoffman. Yeah. Yes. Great act. Um, but a general manager or the front office, to an extent, their job is very similar to a casting director. All right. I've got a group of talented people here. They're all really good at what they do. Is there any thought? to us putting the right people together to maybe even get a better result than what the numbers might tell us if we just have all these good players playing on the same team together. Well, there's a word called cohesion or cohesiveness, right? Whatever you're doing production-wise, if you want to put a cap on it, that's fine. I'm here to tell you that if we get along and I want to take the bullet for you, what we are capable of is far beyond anything that any calculator can quantify. If I like you and I'm willing to literally and figuratively go to bat for you, we got something cooking. And due respect to Nelson Cruz, but like that's kind of a lazy answer to a clubhouse fix to me because you we knew Nelson Cruz was probably cooked coming off of 2022 when it, with the Nationals. And I just don't mm -hmm. think it's practical to expect a guy who has no established standing in a clubhouse who is bad, right, to come in and fix whatever leadership problems you well, like. Maybe Nelson Cruz in Seattle. What, Jay, so what Nelson Cruz represents, and this is something that the outside world might not ever truly be able to conceptualize or wrap their head around. But we have very real examples of this in real life, in, in societal civilian life as well. Think about what happened to the Chicago White Sox when Jose Abreu left town. Jose Abreu, a very respected, a very productive member of that ball club, and more detailed, he was a Latin player amongst many Latin players on that team that they looked up to. So what direction are we going today? Look no farther than Jose Abreu. And when you have a young group of players who are looking for someone to steer them in the right direction, that's who Jose Abreu was. That's what he represented. And when he left, there's a lot of conversation about that group of young Latin players kind of feeling like they didn't have that leader anymore. And I've played with guys, but th this is how it goes. Right? When, also, you come over from but, a, when you come over from a different country, Jay Hay, and you're dealing with stuff like, and, and look, Soto, English speaking, Tatis, English speaking, Bogey, English speaking, right? All, all these. Uh, the point is, it's just a different vibe when you have a guy who has 
from your own country or at least has lived the life you had, those guys gravitate towards each other. I and so Nelson, with his, with his background coming in, saying, look, boys, this is how we're going to do it. Th- that's them just trying to see if they can capture lightning in a bottle. I get it. But to me, that's lazy because the, the key difference between those two examples is that Jose Abreu was an established literal MVP who had spent his entire career in that clubhouse and in that organization and was an organizational, basically legend. Nelson Cruz has no standing other than his career in well, but, the pod. And it's just not, it, there's no way it can be the same but Jay, in terms of the, Jay, what and, I, what and Abreu you, was good. Abreu left so like the, and became kind of bad, right? So like the, we the never state, had to reconcile that. But the whole standing thing in the minor leagues, Jay, and 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 you, I don't know how much of this you've seen, but like when we go for the first my, time, my career go was to quick, a different, but yeah, sorry. <laughs> when we go to a different city, guys from the Dominican, they might be meeting up with each other for the first time since they've been drafted or since they got signed. Right? They were working out together on the island back home, and then they get picked up. And all right, I'm going to Arizona. Well, so am I. Where are you going? Well, I'm going to the A's complex. Well, fuck, I'll be in Goodyear. I'm with the Guardians. Well, I don't know if we're going to catch up. Well, we do. I'll see you at the I'll see you at the complex. And when that happens for the first time, it doesn't matter that you have known this guy for 10 years or you're just meeting him. You're like, hey, this is another dude. This guy's actually from Venezuela. Oh, what's going on, man? And, and you just you 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 get together and you meet because there's safety in what you're experiencing. There's familiarity in what you're experiencing. And so when you have a guy like Nelson Cruz with the dirt under his spikes and the respect that he has from the baseball world in general, outside of being who he is back home, that's a dude, if you play baseball and you're Dominican, you know who the fuck Nelson Cruz is. And if Nelson Cruz is looking you in the eye as a young player in the big leagues and telling you what needs to be done to win, I don't know how you don't fucking listen to that. But these aren't young players. This is Manny Machado, Juan Soto, Xander Bogarts. And they are all they all have hundreds of millions of dollars in the bank. Yes. And that's and Nelson Cruz is bad now. So like they they can have as much respect for him as as they want. The, mm-hmm. Nelson Cruz going in to talk to those guys is just not the same as Jose Abreu talking to Luis Robert and talking to Eloy Jay Jimenez. Hay. Couldn't agree more, right. dude. Couldn't agree more. I, I agree. A th- I was just trying to give you the insight yeah, no, no, as no, to right. okay. why okay. they would have made that move. Not that it was a good move. Yeah. Not that it was a good move. And I agree with you saying that it was lazy because what else? It's almost like, yes, it was lazy, but what else would you have them do in that scenario as well? Because if you do have a group of guys that you feel like you need to find somehow some way to connect with them and you think that that is something that can happen, well, then that's something you do because outside of that, what would they have done? I, Probably nothing. That's a Hail Mary move, man, because he was really bad I in know. 22. So like this, I get it th- for that to be your fucking plan to tie your $1 billion but, infield or your, your billion dollar like cornerstone big four together. Again, I think it's lazy. Well, I, I think it's a, a lazy yeah, I, person's answer to let's let's fix our Latin heavy clubhouse. Yeah, they didn't want Nelly coming in or they didn't expect Nelly coming in to hit third and pop 30. I don't think that was the expectation. <laughs> They would have liked a little more than what they got, but they were hoping that it could have been enough that he sticks around and stays and is able to have that kind of an impact. But it just didn't happen. Didn't play out that way. Because again, to your point, these aren't 19, 20 year old kids who are trying to figure it out. These are, you know, some of them potential Hall of Fame conversationalists and multi, multi gajillionaires. Yeah. To kind of validate what Dallas has been saying about the impact that a Nelson Cruz can have, um, the you missed this interview because I can't remember which daughter it was, the first, second, I don't know. But you, when in spring training of 2019, the Nelly interview that you went and did, I didn't get to go do it. Was, yeah, yes. second. Okay. So uh, I'm interviewing Nelson Cruz. And I had a previous relationship with um, Rocco Baldelli. So just walking around Twins spring training camp that year, uh, they were gushing about the impact that Nelson Cruz was having on their younger players. Like guys like a Miguel Sano that maybe he was overweight, maybe he wasn't as motivated. Now he's in the gym Whenever Nelson Cruz is in, if Nelson Cruz is in the gym, you have no excuse to not be in the gym. And Mm -hmm. that year, I believe Sano, 
that was the year that the Twins set the uh, single season record, record for most homers, and I believe it was a career high in home runs for Miguel Sano that year. Um, so yeah, like that was just like all unprompted. Like I wasn't asking; it was all unprompted. Like, hey, like this dude, like he walks around, people do what he does. Uh, dude's almost forty years old. He's in the gym pressing one hundred fifteen pound dumbbells, and everyone sees that, and they're like. If he's at this stage of his career and he's working that hard, what excuse mm-hmm. do I have if I'm 23? Uh, which Straight isn't up. the exact same scenario that we're talking about with the Padres because these aren't young kids. I mean, like Tatis is still a young kid. Manny's 31. Uh, Bogey, I think, is like 31, 32. So it's like, you know, these guys have won but, before. Soto's and, is and still the, a young kid, but like Jer- he's probably walking around feeling like I'm established. Like I may not be, uh, I'm, I'm not an old vet. But I'm established in so, this league. People know my name, and I make a lot. I'm going to make a lot of money. So now think about it like this: We've already had the conversation with David Ortiz earlier this season about how a guy like Big Poppy, the greatest designated hitter of all fucking time, potentially, how he is received or not received in the clubhouse, in a clubhouse where people are very familiar with him, in a clubhouse where people know who that dude is. All right. And now you got Nelson Cruz in a similar position, not being well received or not not having his information. It's not it's not being processed, however you want to look at it. But I think that can also start to shed light on something other people have talked about, which is today's player and the evolution of today's player and whether or not they put stock in what an old guy like Poppy might have to say, or an old guy like Nelson Cruz might have to say. I'd like to think that they care about what they have to say and the experiences that they've had because that can help. And if anything, maybe AJ Preller was hoping, hey, I've got a couple of the older guys in that room that could maybe learn how to lead a little differently or on a different level. And I've got a couple of young guys in that group that I think can be led are still impressionable enough where if I bring a Nelson Cruz in, he might be able to give them the business a bit and set them off on a trajectory that turns them into great leaders. Maybe that's what the thought was as well. So I understand the idea of thinking it was lazy. I can also understand the idea uh, of hoping to have happen what they hoped would have had happen because it's happened in the past. It just didn't happen. Yet. Yeah. Uh, Blake Snell for Cy Young. I got to go. All right. One, one question before you leave Dallas. Yo. Is it possible for this to be a one offseason fix? Can the Padres become what we expected them to be next year in one offseason? I think they can. As much as I say that the clubhouse is irredeemable or it's tough to get it back, I think it's just a matter of some guys kind of falling in line and realizing what could have been this year if things would have been a little different. And maybe that's the realization that they needed so that they can get their shit together and come back next year being the San Diego Padres that they think they can be. But I don't think it's, I don't think it's completely over, but as of right now with what we're hearing, it seems like it's a long, long ways away. Yeah. Plus in fairness, we don't know if that team has Juan Soto next year. Exactly. Yeah. Very different. Yeah. All right. That's Dallas Braden broadcaster of the Oakland A's. Of the AL West, one of the best divisions in baseball. They're in it. They are a team. They're there. They're part of it. Thank you, Dallas. What is that? That is a... Estuary Ruiz. uh, Estuary. Okay, Ruiz, sure. Okay. Uh, Rookie record. Yeah, I didn't know if you knew this, but Estuary Ruiz uh, set the franchise record for stolen bases as a rookie. He did that in the first half. He leads the league, right? first half of the season. He leads the league. Uh, Leads the American League is nipping... At the heels of Ronald Acuna Jr. Ronnie's got 67 of them thangs. Esty's got 61 of them oh, thangs. Acuna's got a tough calf. I don't know if he's going to steal. Oh, shit. He did last night. He did. And he's back. And he's going to probably go for 70. <laughs> and Esty yeah. got hosed last night. Shit. <laughs> Can't wait. Shit. All right, boys. I'm gone. Bye, Dallas. Uh, even under the bright lights of the playoffs, Blue Moon, Belgian white, Belgian style wheat ale is the beer that's made brighter. Blue Moon was born in a ballpark for baseball fans. First brewed at Coors Field in Denver, Colorado. 
From its bold flavor, refreshing flavor to its re- beautiful, bright color, Blue Moon is as iconic as America's pastime. Uh, we discussed some postseason travel that we might be dabbling in. Very excited for that. We're going to be drinking some Blue Moons maybe in your town. If you're a fan of a team that's going to the playoffs, we might be there. We'll bring the Blue Moons. You bring the excitement. With its refreshing flavor with Valencia orange peel for a subtle sweetness and hints of coriander, Blue Moon Belgian White Belgian style wheat ale. That is a mouthful. It is a one of a kind Ooh, beer that's made brighter. That's it's carefully what I want, crafted and full flavored with refreshing notes and a smooth, creamy finish. Blue Moon was brewed by baseball. So it's the perfect match for the playoffs. The crack of a beer, the pour, the first sip, that bold flavor. Blue Moon always feels like a special occasion. Best served with its signature orange garnish to showcase its beautiful, bright color. A beer this good it only go. comes around once in a blue moon, but you can enjoy it all through the playoffs brighten up the baseball playoffs with blue moon belgian style wheat ale it's a one of a kind every time check out shop.bluemoonbrewingcompany.com for fresh baseball merch and visit get.bluemoonbeer.com slash rocket to find blue moon delivery options that is get.bluemoonbeer.com slash rocket blue moon Made writers celebrate responsibly. Blue Moon Brewing Company, Golden, Colorado Ale. Yeah, yeah. If you're in the car right now, then what's stopping you from pulling out over to the closest station, gas station, and getting a Blue Moon? That's what I'm saying. Or just uh, for saying. when you get home, cu- crack a couple. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And an orange. Garnish. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Thank you, Joe. Uh, before we move on from the Padres, quickly. Um, do you think that this can be fixed in one offseason, Joseph? Well, I don't know. I just know that when I, Dallas just talked to the manager for like two hours, he said last podcast, then comes back the next podcast, says this can't be fixed. <laughs> so, <laughs> I, I mean, it is a very much a two plus two situation. Yeah. So I'm not, I, you probably know better than me. I don't fucking know. I'm reading these articles like everyone else. It doesn't seem good, you know? No, it really doesn't. And uh, I don't know. I, I think if you're a Padres fan and you want some positivity or if I'm going to put my myself in a Padres position, like I'm a Padres fan right now, I'm going to sit there and I'm going to say, well, Xander Bogarts hit that walk off home run last night. That didn't seem like a team that didn't like each other. You got Machado dapping up bogey. Everyone's everyone seems really happy and excited. I think if I were a Padres fan, And maybe it's just because, I don't know, my brain is poisoned by being a Red Sox fan over the last few years that seeing Bogarts hit that walk off home run and seeing like him celebrate like it's a walk off home run. Like you're not just going to like put your head down and run the bases. I get it. Like you want to be excited. But I think I would be sitting there being like, man, this is kind of embarrassing. Like this is what this this walk off home run could have meant so much more. This could have been such an electric moment as the Padres are chasing uh, a playoff berth. And instead, we're just playing out the string, knowing that it's over. Like they they had to put a cap on season tickets this year. (laughs) That's how high the demand was. They had to put a cap on it and be like, all right, you fucking animals. There's only so many tickets for the entire season. So maybe there are some Padres fans out there that are sitting there that are thinking like, man, you know, Bogey hitting a walk off home run like that's cool and all. But A, it's the Rockies. B, we're not going to the fucking playoffs like this is this is this is embarrassing. This is frustrating. And I I don't enjoy this. I will say that I think I think that they could be good next year, like with the same team. And Jay Hayes said it last podcast with all those numbers about like how unlucky they've kind of gotten and whether it's luck or whatever, but all those close, they got a winning, great win differential for where they're at. They got a lot of fucking good players. I think if they start winning, a lot of the clubhouse problems would probably go away and how much of it, you know, they could definitely be beastly like next year at the the same team. Yeah, I think as long as the expectations aren't like we're going to the World Series anymore. Like if if the expectations yeah. are we're going to compete for postseason spots, I, I think there's no question that it can turn around as soon as next season. I don't I'm sure they'll fix a few things. The roster won't be exactly the same, but on paper you have uh, you know, a a really dynamic front two at the top of your rotation. You still have, you know, four to five, you know, all star caliber uh 
bats in your lineup. Obviously, the depth is what it is, but I, I think as long as it's we're going to compete with the D-backs and the Giants and the other wild card teams uh, and not we're going to go toe to toe with the Dodgers, I, I think those expectations are pretty reasonable. Mm. Yeah, yeah, it is I sad, wish it I is sad because they are optimism about it. They, they what? I wish I had more optimism about it. You're off the bandwagon, dude. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not saying I'm off the bandwagon. I just, I don't know. I, it, it, the well appears to be poisoned, young Joseph. The well seems, to, I don't know how you can take, like, it, some of the reasons why the, the Padres were slash are supposed to be great, I don't know that I believe in any, like, Darvish ain't getting any younger. Blake Snell, the Cy Young, he's probably leaving in free agency. There is a chance that you trade Juan Soto this winter. So some of your like you can look at some of the, the pieces being like, man, that Jay Cronworth well, contract fucking sucks. Like Darvish. I mean, even when he was bad, he straight up, uh, you know, he, he got hurt too. some of the pieces that are coming back. Like it would almost you'd rather have it be flip flopped. Some of the pieces that are going out are your best pieces. Well, some I of mean, the pieces that are staying are the pieces you wish you could move on from. To be fair, the question was, can can they turn it around by next season if they actively choose to shed great players in order to become less expensive or mm. or just pivot direction, then that obviously changes the math. If they trade Juan Soto and Blake Snell is not on the team next year, they're a much worse team than they are right now. Yeah. And the hope would be a lot less mm. or lower. And I I don't see Blake Snell coming back. I mean, how much no. how many how many of these contracts can they give? He's about to get paid a decent yeah. amount. I do. He's gonna get paid a fuck ton. But I also I saw someone try to compare Blake Snell's impending free agency to Robbie Ray. It's like, well, that contract don't look so good right now. Like if you're the Padres, can you afford another contract where it's like, all right, we paid you based on what you did, not what you're not what you're about to do. Yeah. I think they've already got some of those. Yeah. And I think Blake Snell's probably kind of went a little bit going to be a risky contract because, you know, there's going to be teams or at least one team is going to pay a shit ton for him. And he's had, I mean, you know, ups and downs in his career. How, how much do you guys really think Blake Snell's going to get like quickly off the top of your head? Total, total millions of dollars. <sighs> um, Probably like. Call it. The A.V. 28 times six. So basically the slightly more than the Carlos Rodon contract. Sure. That's he got six for too. 162, which is 27 a year. Yeah. There you go. Rodon is if, the benchmark. Then I, then I agree. I think that's, I just think like we really haven't seen a break the bank starting pitcher contract issued since <coughs> basically Garrett Cole like that. Nobody has come close to hitting that number since Cole hit 324. And Strasburg's contract's like obviously a, a fucking disaster, but like DeGrom, <laughs> Rodon, Berrios, Wheeler, Robbie Ray, Gosman, like you're really the the question is, are you getting over a hundred million dollars for some of these guys, or are we talking north of 150? And I just Blake Snell's a a this is offseason talk, but he he is a uniquely fascinating contract i think to discuss because as we i think mentioned on the podcast before he's be, he may win two cy youngs and not have a single cy young vote in any other season of his career so like <laughs> what are you getting exactly on a year-to-year -year basis and i think we all know he needs to be managed carefully in terms of innings he's not a he's not an eight or nine inning or nobody is anymore but i don't know i think it's going to be interesting it is because I mean, at the first month of this year, I kind of thought Blake Snell was washed, to be honest. And there's been a couple of times where I've thought like, okay, he's kind of washed. And then he also has two Cy Youngs. It's probably going to win it this year. It's kind of a guy that a lot of teams are going to be like, fuck, no, we're not going to offer him shit. A lot of teams are going to be like, we'll give him everything. Because he's going to be the best free agent pitcher this offseason. I wonder if some team is like, we'll give you like a really sexy AAV for four years. Like offer him four and one twenty or something like that, or four and one thirty. I just think I feel like the Padres at this point got to be a little gun shy 
with giving out these kind of contracts. I mean, yeah. Well, and they may have a new guy. Uh, if that article is any bellwether, they may have a new person making those decisions. Yeah. So. Mm-hmm. That is going to be interesting. There's just there's no slam dunk starting pitcher on the market this winter. It's all guys where it's like, I like some of this. I don't love all of that. And I don't know who I'm signing up for right now. And it like they're all on the wrong side of 30. Like Snell, Giolito, Wainwright, uh, Nola. What did you say? Wayno? Yeah. Granky. <laughs> Granky. Nola's Nola's another interesting one. Yeah. Like I don't know what the fuck I'm signing. Like he was as a, super as a consistent fan of a team. This year. Yeah. Yeah. As, as a fan of a team that is <clears> in the market for starting pitching desperately this offseason, it could not have come at a like this class could not have come at a worse time. Aaron Nola's like because the, then if you make the wrong decisions, you're just fucked. It's like, all right, cool. I guess since we're paying this guy, we're not gonna be able to trade him now. He sucks. Everyone knows it. We're just idiots for signing him. I don't know. Aaron Nola is interesting, too, because he's basically like as durable as a starting pitcher gets in terms of taking the ball inning starts every year. He has been really good at times, but we're also, if you look in the narrow uh, past, we're talking about a guy who's going to have a four and a half ERA in two of his last three seasons. Like, what is that exactly? Don't know. Interesting. Well, going to be some great offseason podcasts. That was a good tease for those. Yeah, stay tuned. Stay tuned for that off-season talk. But for right now, to put a bow on Blake Snell, uh, we are talking about a pitcher that is leading the league in ERA. It's 233, but he's also walked the most batters in the league, thrown the most wild pitches, and allowed the fewest uh, number of hits on a hits per nine basis at 5.7. Kind of crazy. He's a good pitcher. He's a good pitcher. But in his Cy Young season was back in 2018. I would have guessed it was even before that. I don't, it doesn't seem as recent as, uh, as 2018, but. It was in 2018. The whole debate was, oh, does he have enough innings? He had a sub two in 180 and two thirds innings, which this like in, in, you know, we're only five years into the future, but 180 innings is like, what? That's crazy. That's so many innings that back then you you couldn't even get considered for a Cy Young Award if you didn't hit 200 innings. Now, no one does. So you have to lower your expectations. Blake Snell is at 174 innings with presumably two more starts to go. He's got two more starts to go. Uh, the strikeouts per nine, 11.7, which is like, I mean, he's, you see 11.7, you're like, damn, like that's that's pretty good. He's been right around there pretty much since that 2018 season where he won the Cy Young. It was 11, it was 12.4, 11.3, 11.9, 12 last year, and then 11.7 this year. I give him credit. He really hasn't like I thought it was he's really doing his best to make sure nobody else enters this conversation. For yeah. Daniel Cy Young. Like I really thought Strider mm-hmm. was going to make more of a push. Um, and he he has it's not like what do you have? Thir- 12 strikeouts last night, seven innings, three earned. So it's not like he's not doing his part. But every time Blake Snell takes the ball now, it's like one or zero runs. And it's, you know, it's just tough. It's just tough to give it to Strider in that case on the basis of basically 50 extra strikeouts. Um, <laughs> as dominant yeah, as Strider has been. And, and honestly, I might want Spencer Strider in a postseason start over Blake Snell, if I'm being completely transparent about that. But that's not what this award is about. And in terms of wh- what he's delivered on the field over this stretch, I just, it's not his problem. His team sucks. Even, even given the actual results, like postseason results that I would take Strider over Snell. Mm-hmm. I think if I was deciding to make a, whether I was, just, if I was deciding a postseason start for the 2023 postseason, I would probably go with Spencer Strider. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Do the walks scare you that much? 
Yeah, I just, uh, I don't know. Snell's postseason track record is a, a little bit of a mixed bag. Obviously, a three 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 ERA is nothing to scoff at, but I don't know. I just, yeah. I mean, the walks in the postseason have only become more of an issue. Maybe, maybe that is partly because twenty twenty three isn't included yet, and it might be his best season to date. I just think I have very high expectations for Spencer Strider as it relates to the upcoming postseason. It's more about and he that, just he literally just grew out a beard, so. How the fuck are you going to mm. like? <laughs> yeah. Come also, up. if you're sitting there thinking like, okay, he leads the league in walks, but he's allowed the fewest amount of hits on a rate basis. Then what's the, what's the whip? What's the traffic look like? It's a one, one, nine, five, call it one twenty. Spencer Strider's whip would be one Oh six. I, I would guess that's interesting. You bring that up. I would guess that a one one nine or a one two zero whip and an ERA of two point three three is damn near unprecedented in Major League Baseball history. I'm gonna look that up right now because I can. You guys keep chattering, but I bet I bet I bet it's almost impossible to have a whip because that's not that good of a whip in the modern one one nine. It's not that great. I, where do you think that ranks this season? In among qual, let's look this up too. Fifteenth. Amongst qualified, qualified, yeah, starters qualified starters in in the National League or whatever. all Major League Baseball. Whatever. MLB. Let's just do, okay. S- let's just do MLB. In all of Major League Baseball, a 1-1-9 whip amongst qualifying starters, I'm going to say is 12. I'm going to say 9. Okay, let's see. I'm taking way below that. I'm, I'm going to say, without looking, I'm going to say 20-something. T- 23rd. Um... <laughs> Let's see. Running, running, running. Uh, it is 21st. It's Ooh. right in between Jose Barrios and Chris Bassett. Um, well, Blue Jays. Zach Eflin not leads bad, baseball. Not bad it, pitchers, though. What's that? Not bad pitchers. No, 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 no. It, this isn't like, a, I don't know, man. I just 1.195 in the modern game is more like, yeah, yeah, that's fine. Like that's not a problem, yeah, but that's not that's not really driving a two, a sub two ERA. So let's see, find players, seasons matching criteria, season. We want a whip. You guys can talk about something else if you want, but uh, well, I'm looking up. I'm looking up. So what did I say it was it was a one twenty? Uh, yeah. What whip? So the league average is one twenty one. Yeah. So he's a league average whip. There you go. So a whip that high and an ERA below, we'll just go 2.50. Give us some stuff to work with. Let's see yeah. how many times that's happened. <laughs> Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe this is just a huge waste of time and it's going to be a big What are you using? Play index? Yeah. What do you use? Yeah, play index. Yeah. Um, all right. Yeah, pretty rare. Not like un- Not literally unprecedented, but pretty damn rare. Uh, the last instance, and this is going to ring very true, I think, for you, Jared. The last instance of a guy having an ERA this low and a whip this high was Clay Buckholes in 2010. Mm-hmm. Wow. That, wow. That feels Clay right, drill. doesn't it? Um, yeah. Before, before that, so that's 13 years ago. Before that, mm-hmm. you have to go back another six years all the way to 2004 for Jake Peavy's age 23 season. And then before that, the only other instances in the wild card era is Tom Glavin in 1998. There are four times since 1995 this has happened. So wow. there you go. That was maybe worth it. Yeah. It was educational, yeah. to say the least. So he's allowing yeah. traffic, but he's shutting them down when it matters. Yeah. Because yeah. he's got nasty wipeout shit. And I believe it's a slider <laughs> that no one can touch, right? His slider is That's like one of the best. Shit. Yeah, it's one of the best pitches in the league this year. I don't know what batters are hitting against it. It's, woo, check that run value. Strider has the opposite problem, where he strikes out everybody, but then somehow, either either Strider gets, like, fucking shelled. Because Strider, as much as everyone says how good he is, which he is, he has a 3-7 ERA, mm-hmm. which I think is way higher than anyone who's, like, casually paying attention would ever guess. And it will, it will either be something like last night, where he's shutting the Phillies down, having a great game, one inning, like walks the guy, gives up a hit, and then Bryce Harper hits a three-run home run, has one kind of dicey inning, and they max out on a three-run bomb at the worst time possible. Or 
he'll get shelled just in like the first two innings. And it's kind of scattered his ZRA. Made it so, way worse than it uh, should be. This is... Um, Blake Snell, opponents are hitting 123 against his slider, which is the lowest batting average against uh, on any slider in, in Major League Baseball. But Spencer Strider is number two. On uh, what? What pitch? Slider. Slider. Um, I also want to back up. He's got up. the second lowest. Kodai Senga, 426 OPS against his slider. Blake Snell is number two at 468. Spencer Strider, uh, 470. Third. So- so Joey brought up two things there. Jared just covered the slider. I'm going to cover him shutting him down when the runners get on base because Blake Snell has a 159 batting average allowed with runners in scoring position this year, which is about 30 points better than the next closest qualified pitcher in baseball and would be the best single season batting average allowed with runners in scoring position for any qualified pitcher in Padres franchise history. Um, mm. So, yes. He's allowing more base runners than you would think for a guy with his ERA, but he's basically allowing he's allowing nobody to touch him, essentially, even when those guys get on. That's an interesting mix to me, too, because I wonder how much of that is choice and like true ability to shut down base runner or like scoring runs, even when people are on base, and how much of that might be in line to bite him in the ass once the postseason starts, because... Fangrass also has a stat called left on base percentage, which is not totally different from what we're talking about, but it's basically white, like what percentage of the runners on base are stranded that you allow on. And Blake Snell has the highest rate by far in major league baseball this season among qualified starters. So th- well, we that, that doesn't take away Blake from Snell his Cy Young season. candidacy at all. That's more just like, how is it happening and what can we expect moving forward? Well, it's dependent on a slider. Then you slow in the slider and if, and he's walking a bunch of guys. So if you're a guy who's not going to swing at the slider, you're going to get walked and you're, and then Blake is fucked. But if it's so nasty, you're not hitting it. So if you are going to swing at it, it's way out of the zone and you're striking out. So it's like you're walking guys, but the slider's so nasty. No one can touch it. No one's going to hit a fucking three run bomb off you when you do walk guys. Hmm. Well, we'll see. That's see just what happens p- in free agency. That's just for my pitching lab. That's the, that's Joey's pitching lab for you. Joey's pitching lab. And I'm looking at Strider. I got a lot of comps for Strider. Reminds me of a young Glass now with those two pitches. You know how Glass now early in his career, look how nasty he is, but his ERA was a kind of higher, and it kind of makes you wonder, is this Strider getting unlucky, or is he just getting bitten by only having two main options where the pitches are nasty, they have great stats, but people get sit on it. That was a very big narrative for Glass now in 2020, 2021, was this dude needs a third pitch. And look at him now. He's beasting. He's beasting Mm -hmm. with three pitches. I mean, to be fair, Spencer Strider is better than Tyler Glass now has ever been. I mean, this that's what is the debate there? This season, Spencer Strider is better than any season Tyler Glass now has contributed in his career. Might be better than any combination of seasons. That Tyler Glass now has ever tribu- contributed wow. in his career. This what are we talking really about? Well, I'd like to hear that. Yeah. Tyler Glass now has never thrown more than 111 innings in any season. Oh, and but his, but it, what his stats this year? He's got great stats this year. I know he's missed he a lot a of time. Three, but... five, he has a three five three in 109 and two thirds <laughs> innings. So you're gonna take tw- you're gonna take point two ERA over double well, the innings. To be mm-hmm. fair, I thought it was a lot better than that. So thank you. And I'm not saying hey, and listen, I'm not saying I'm saying Strider's better than. Glassnow and everybody. But I did think Glassnow was doing a lot better than that this year. Do you have a bad his outing last, last game? What the fuck? His last two starts have been a little rough. His ERA has gone from 298 to the 353 just on his last two starts alone. There you go. That ten earned in 10 innings. The pitching lab is staying open, boys. I just didn't see the last two starts. It's not an indictment <laughs> on me. The lab is open. Uh, I'm not going to hit the breaking news sound, but... Uh, it's moderate breaking news. Uh, the Orioles have placed Ryan Mountcastle on the injured list. Uh, he had a little, he came out of the game, what, on last Friday, last Wednesday? It was one of those days uh, with a shoulder injury. And so he's on the injured list with less than two weeks to go. All right. So some something to keep an eye on for the postseason as he's a, he's a big piece of what they got going on there offensively. 
Speaking well, of postseason, you're going to want tickets, I bet. Absolutely. Uh, Buying tickets to your favorite events shouldn't be stressful. Game time is the fast and easy way to buy tickets to all the sports, music, comedy, and theater near you. With killer deals on last-minute tickets and their best price guarantee, you can stop stressing over all the tickets and start getting hyped for all the fun that you're going to have. Listen, October, October, October baseball, TikTok, it's coming up. You're going to want tickets. Forget planning months in advance. Game time has deals on tickets right up to the day of the event. Get exclusive flash deals on tickets for football, basketball, baseball, concerts, comedy, theater, and more. The game time guarantee means you'll always get the best price. If you find tickets in the same section and row for less, game time will credit you 110% of the difference. Get images of your seat before you buy so you know exactly what to expect when you arrive. Buy tickets in a matter of seconds, two taps, and you are set. Tickets are sent directly to your phone so you never have to dig through your email. Download the game time app, create an account, use the promo code Jared. That is J A R E D. You will get $20 off your first purchase. Terms apply. Again, create an account. Use the promo code Jared for $20 off. Uh, download the Game Time app today. Last minute tickets, lowest price guaranteed. Um, quick little peek at the standings here. Uh, because the American League West, the American League West for everyone. <laughs> For everyone who wanted to give up. For everyone who said it was over. For everyone who said, take it home. That's a wrap. That's all she wrote. Cowboy. What do you got to say now? Cowboy. What have you got to say now that the Texas Rangers are about to finish off those pieces of shit from up in Boston. Only a half game out of first place coming into play today. If you're listening to this on Wednesday night, the Texas Rangers might already be back in first place. Way too many people said it's over. Way too many people looked at how shitty the bullpen was. The, the, the 30% conversion of saves over the last two months. Maybe you looked at that and said, it's a wrap. Josh Young hurt. He's back. Max Scherzer not going to pitch another game again. Don't give a shit. We got Nathan Ovaldi out there doing everything he can to bring the Texas Rangers to the promised land. And that is first place in the AL West. Only a half game out coming into play today. I don't want to hear another fucking negative word about the Texas Rangers. When the season's over... When the season's over and you want to you want to toss dirt on our grave, if that's the case, then do it. You can dump that dirt on our grave. We don't give a fuck because we went down playing as hard as we've been playing all goddamn year. And we'll yeah. see. We'll see where it goes. Because right now, Joe, it's right there. It's right there in front of us. I know we're, we're tied with the Seattle Mariners. Half game out, both of them. Yeah. 83 and 68 coming into play today. And if you're a cowboy and your dick ain't hard for this weekend in this series with the fucking <laughs> semen coming into town, then you are not a cowboy. You need to get some erectile dysfunction medicine because this That's is what fucking, I'm saying. This is a series of the year coming up. This is for all the marbles. The uh, Texas Rangers finish off the Boston Red Sox today. It's a 205 game here on the East Coast. And then the Seattle Mariners, after an off day on Thursday, the Seattle Mariners come to town for a three-game set. Oh. Mariners, Rangers. We'll see what we got. Who are the Mariners playing tonight? Mariners are playing the Oakland Athletics. Yes. Oh! Yeah. That's a just a feast show. Our boy George Kirby on the bumpy. Wow. You, you know he's going to hit that 90 pitch mark. Yeah, yeah he is. <clears throat> Yeah, he is. Yeah, this is, um, this is crazy. It's anyone's game right now. It's anyone's game. Well, I'm, I'm just asking if if do you guys feel stupid for not sticking with the range? No, 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 no. I'm not no, going to let this happen. No, we, no, I am no. not going to let this happen. If what? we need to go get the audio of the podcast where you ask get us it. point blank, are mm -hmm. you getting off of the Rangers or are you sticking or are you going to get with the Mariners? And you mm -hmm. asked us all. I know yep. for certain what my response was. 
and and everybody said, "Whoa, you're sticking with the Rangers!" Whoa. <laughs> okay, you're, all right, all right, you're with us then. All right, I'm not Good. with you. I'm fucking not no, going yeah. with the Rangers. Yeah, Joey and Dallas are on their own island. I guess that's well, half the podcast. Dallas is but... the biggest flip flopper, clout chaser of all time. <laughs> Dallas, if if a team Whatever gets Manfred hot for two wants, weeks. Right? Yeah, yeah. Whatever the na- whatever narrative Rob Manfred wants, that's what Dallas is pushing. And then he'll hop from one team to the next. He'll pick so many teams over the course of a year that you'll be so fucking confused by the end of it all that you're just like, I guess he said that. I don't know. I don't remember. And then he'll do the I told you so. It's, that's what he does. It's funny because the one thing we won't forget and can't get confused is Alec Manoa for Cy Young. <laughs> yeah, that was a tough pick. For him, I'm that saying. I, I know uh, there might have been other people on the podcast who picked it, but we don't need to focus on that part. I'm just saying. I believe. I, I believe. I, I wait. I don't know if he was Manoa. I think I was Manoa. I don't. I don't. Think no, he no. Went we Manoa confirmed the, yeah. this. Jake confirmed it last podcast. I thought that Dallas he went Manoa also too? picked Manoa. Yeah. You gotta get your brain checked out, buddy. This is the second time. Did you, were you here? Was that a, a stunt? I remember double last everything podcast? that happens on this podcast. I have great long term memory. I have awful short term memory. Mm. Well, you're also out there doing a lot of content. You know, this is I got a lot of shit going this on. This is my main this you is know? my main podcast platform. I got a few others, you yeah. know, but the, their their distribution isn't quite as good. Yeah. <laughs> right. Right. Th- that's where we're at right now. I I'll say so, this about if we're gonna shit on Dallas for picking the fucking let's Astros do it. and let's fucking do it. I, I <laughs> <laughs> but I, I I picked the Astros and I'm sticking with the Astros. No, 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 no. Oh, just to be fair. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. The question wasn't who would win the division. The question was, are you it was a Rangers Mariners thing is what I'm talking about from like two weeks ago where the Rangers okay. were in their death spiral and it was like everybody's hopping off the Titanic. I may just go okay. get the audio myself after this go podcast so we can play it tomorrow. <laughs> um, no, no, no. I'm. I, I, I'm squarely on the Astros to win the division. That has been still. a preseason pick. Yeah, still. And the and I took the Rangers when Jared asked us. So play the cowboy music. I'm my I'm a cowboy with my dick hard for the weekend or whatever. And <laughs> it's time to go. Cowboy. Yeah, there we, there it is. <laughs> cowboy. <laughs> well, oh, listen, I brother, sir. Wait. There ain't there ain't. There ain't just one type of cowboy out there. There's plenty of types of cowboys down here in Texas. It ain't, it ain't, the town ain't big enough for the two of us. And I'm talking right now. The Houston Astros are the real cowboys now. And they're going to win it, even though they choke so hard, bro. Because guess what? Not only do they have that one, that cushion, they swept the Rangers. They swept the Rangers. And then who've they played since? Oakland lost two out of three. Then they played Kansas City, lost two out of three. Now they're getting beat in by the Orioles and they're playing Kansas City again. Like if you went into the stretch, they have two series against Kansas City and Oakland. The yeah. division was over right there. The Houston Astros have to play the Athletics and the Royals for nine games and they already have a lead. It's over. Also, uh, <laughs> we mentioned how the Rangers and Mariners are playing each other this weekend. They also finished the season against each other. Yep. In Seattle. Yep. And and, the, wow, and so the, that uh, could be the biggest series of the season. They could give us the two biggest series. Wow. Yeah. I haven't I don't remember like this season coming down to like this tight at these races in in a while. These are very exciting races. Three teams. Three teams within a half game of each other for the ALS. Rob and does, then, Rob does it again. The script is the script was juicy this year. Um, the Miami, Mar- like the even the NL wild card, we've got some good races. The NL wild card, the Phils, Joe, they've got the top wild card spot. Then you have the D backs, future Red Sox general manager Mike Hazen leading the D backs to the second wild card, who have a half game lead over the Chicago Cubs, who are clinging to a half game lead over the Miami Marlins who are clinging to a half game lead over the Cincinnati Reds. Yeah, I, it is a log jam. All these all these teams are like must watch de- games cuz you saw the Cubs we we locked the Cubs in and then they just get swept by the Diamondbacks over the weekend. Yeah. Um, I mean, what a fucking also, series. This the this uh this race in the AL West, second place in the AL West, you're battling it out for the third wild card spot. Mm-hmm. Tampa Bay I'm not going to call it a wrap on the AL East, but they've got some breathing room here. Baltimore has over Tampa at two and a half games. So it's a nine and a half game lead 
that Tampa has over the Toronto Blue Jays. And Toronto has a one game lead over the Rangers and Mariners who are tied for that uh, third wild card spot. That's the wild part. The Astros might not make the playoffs. Like the Astros might not make the playoffs. The Mariners might not. The Rangers might like any team that is like those te- three teams in the AL West. They are within a half game today, September twentieth. They're within a half game of first place in their own division. There's a chance that two of those teams don't even make the playoffs. Mm-hmm. That's what's so exciting about it because you got the Blue Jays, Astros, Mariners, and Rangers. One of those teams isn't making it, and whatever that is, is a massive disappointment. Massive disappointment. Like every single one of those teams sh- at, should be in the playoffs. Go, either coming into the year at one point in the season had such a big lead for the Rangers where that if they don't make it, it was a choke. Mm. So it's time yeah, to sack up, cowboy. Is there only is there only one team in this conversation, Jay Hay, where if they don't make the playoffs, it's considered a choke? Like, is it the Rangers just because they were in first for so long and they held it? No, I still don't think I, I don't think it's a choke for I don't think it would be a choke for any of the teams. I think I would is how I would settle on it, because I think the Rangers have now been displaced out of first for long enough where it would be a stretch to call it a choke. And I think we all knew how competitive the division was going to be or could be. No, I'm, this is not a choke okay, for me. If the Astros don't make the playoffs. That's fucking wild. That's that, a choke. That's a choke. I think that would be a, a very unfortunate turn of events for them. I would, I, this is semantics a little bit, but of course, but I, I think I would reserve the choke thing for a larger fall in a less like frothy overall situation. So you're saying yeah. like you're t- so a choke is like when you have it in the bag and then you just fumble the bag, you know, you have yeah, the like, fucking huge like, lead and you fumble it. I feel like we know the chokes in major league baseball when they have happened and Mets last year. Well, no. Wow. Did that? No, no. I'm thinking, I'm thinking more like the Mets in, uh, um, whatever it was like 15 years prior, that famous collapse down the stretch where, the Phillies overtook the division because uh, the Mar because they lost uh, the Mets lost to like a moribund Marlins team on the last day. Tom Glavin, remember that what was that oh eight or something? Tom Glavin allowed like seven earned runs in the first inning in a must win so game Mar- for the Mets, yeah, and it was like Mar- immediately fucking over. Um, <laughs> that that's that's kind of what I what I was thinking. Um, or like I remember know, skipping school to watch Tom Glavin try to win his three hundredth game. It was a day game. Like 2006 or seven. Maybe. Did he get it? It's a nice random. Memory. I think he did. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. He did get it. <clears throat> Tom Glavin, Tommy G. Bill Rick is finest. Shout out to Bill Rick in Massachusetts. They named a street after him and they retired his hockey jersey. Or, or what about like, what was it? It was 2011 where the Red Sox collapsed, right? Mm hmm. Yeah. Not, I mean, I'm not trying to be a dickhead. I'm just saying like Evan Longoria hitting the home run to like send the Rays to the postseason and like that whole sequence with what the Orioles did and then what the Rays did and where the Red Sox had come from. That's a collapse. I don't think the Astros yeah. missing the playoffs would be a collapse. I think it would be a fucking bummer for them though. It would be such yeah. a bummer. It would be almost like uh, I would it, yeah, obviously not maybe not choke, but it would be uh, just as bad. I think I, it's I think equally any, disappointing any for all three of these teams at this point. I think all three of them have enough skin in this game and have had a big enough taste of, we can really get to the postseason this year for it to be like an, an equally disappointing turn of events for whichever team doesn't get in. If that's how it plays out. Uh, this town ain't big enough for the two of us. That is the definition of this race. They town ain't big enough for the four of us. Yeah. Okay. Make that the title of this podcast or this segment. All right. Town ain't big enough for that could be in a recurring segment every single time we do a pod because this race is going back and forth and it's coming out of the wire. This town ain't big enough for the four of us. I wouldn't be surprised if Manfred expands the playoffs to get them all in. Yeah. Just 30 he teams might. in. March Madness style. Dallas will be like, what a uh, fucking great idea. <laughs> <laughs> this, uh, <laughs> you see this tweet? 
Baseball is where you follow a team for six months to see if they win the chance to compete in a 2 p.m. playoff game broadcast on a work day on a channel you don't receive. <laughs> <laughs> it is a funny reminder every year how fucking terrible the postseason broadcasts are in the early rounds, particularly. Yeah, that's bad. Yeah. It's like, oh, we're doing baseball. I mean, it's like, put up the baseball broadcast machine. Like, lad, it's like some, like one of those traveling carnivals. It's all rickety bullshit. That's what it feels like half the time. That's when, um, that's when I have like that moment of man, I like I I once again feel lucky that this is my job because there are a lot of times where it's like, yeah, it's long hours and it's shitty and the, the travel and all that stuff. But when there is playoff baseball on and it's 2 p.m. and you're like, I remember when I had a desk job working nine to five and I wouldn't be able like I would just miss a, a fucking playoff game, like something that's like very important to my interests and my passion. Uh, that's when I have that moment of like, all right, this is cool. Like, this is my job. Like, I, I, I don't have to miss the game because it's my job to watch it. Like, this is great. That's where I have those moments is when the, the fucking TBS games are on at 2 p.m. <laughs> and it's like a very big game. What was it? Uh, the 20, the Cardinal, was it the Cardinals and the Dodgers maybe where the game was over by like the first fucking inning? It was the Braves. And it was like a Cardinals. day game. Was it Braves Cardinals? But it wasn't the day game. It, yeah, it was like a three o'clock game, four o'clock game, yeah. maybe. They yeah, gave up just, eleven like, runs like... in the first inning. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You're just like, oh man, I can't wait to watch some playoff baseball, and you're all excited, and you sit down. And it's fucking eleven nothing after the first inning. Game five. Yeah, last game of the series. The pay. Yeah, we got them at home, boys. We got this. Yeah, yeah. That was tough. <laughs> that was just a, that was a tough showing. Um. Let me see. Uh, we're in the heat of the summer and you need a pair of great shades that you don't have to baby. Knock around sunglasses is the go to for quality polarized shades that won't break the bank. Plus, they just released their first set of teams for their official MLB collection, including Red Sox and Yankees. Don't be the person that's squinting into the sun or worried about getting sand on their overpriced sunglasses. Check out knockaround.com for great looking polarized shades starting at just 28 bucks and use the promo code ROCKET. To get free shipping on your order. A couple things before we get out of here. Um, Kikuchi. <laughs> thinks he'll be fine for his next start after he left the game with cramps. The biggest revelation was that he said it may have been caused by only getting 11 hours of sleep last night. Instead of his usual 13 or 14 hours. How the fuck, not just as a professional athlete, as a human being, how do you sleep for 14 hours? Like, are you depressed? If you sleep, like, there's just a point, like, they, they do all these kind of, like, sleep studies, like, eight hours, like, it's eight hours for a reason. There's, like, REM cycles and all that shit. That's not true. We're like, oh, if you get six hours, like, you, you, you've you woken up in the middle of a REM cycle, and that's why you feel groggy. Like, you want to you wanna wake up at the end of a REM cycle. This motherfucker sleeps for 14 fucking, <laughs> you're only awake for 10 hours a day? How? Because. Like, how do you, if you're a professional athlete, how do you have enough time to get all your meals in, to train, to prepare for your next fucking start. Like, I don't understand. 14 fucking hours of sleep. And like, how does your body, oh, like you have to like put yourself in a medically induced coma. It's called like, being how all many people in. Ever, it's called being yeah, all in. But like, you never been your, all in. your body only allows you to stay asleep for a certain amount of time. Like, how are you doing it? If you're all in, bro, giving it your all, he's tired at night because he's fucking practicing a lot. If you're all in. He's all I think in. I've gotten he's 14 this. hours of sleep this week. Well, it's yeah. time to reconsider how much you're really trying to make the big leagues again, Jay. Yeah, no, like, I think we have different. Yeah, we got different stuff going on, but we need yeah, you. I, I, like, you could give me 14 hours of like no responsibility or nothing, like just sleep guy, and I would never be able to sleep that long. Yeah, that's tough. You would, that has to. You would have to medicate me in some way to be able to sleep for thirteen or fourteen hours. Let alone do it yeah. day after fucking day. I would genuinely feel depressed. I would be like, "That was too much sleep. I need to get out of bed. Like, I feel like a piece of shit. Like, nothing about that is 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 rejuvenating." So well, fourteen hours. I'll tell you what it is. What is it? Well, you know, Kikuchi and Shohei went to the same high school, right? 
I did not know that. And they fucking they they fucking both sleep a lot. Shohei's no for sleep. He sleeps ten hours a night and he gets a two hour nap or something like that. So a lot of sleep for Shohei. That's what I'm saying. Performance. They went to a sleep high school. All right, they're from a. They sleep, went to a sleep. They're from school. a sleepy town. It's just it's just the culture, man. They're from a sleepy fucking town. It's how do you rejuvenate? If I'm a Blue Jays fan, I'm a little pissed. Like I mean, they, we're competing for a playoff spot, and you're gonna fucking skip out on three hours of sleep for the fucking one of the biggest games of the year. And you got cramps, like yeah, sorry, not really professional. Jake, can you book a sleep study specialist? Like, I want to know if there are real benefits to this, or if there's a chance it could actually be detrimental. Fourteen, like hours. sleeping that many hours a day. There's no way. Like, you're like, is sleep more important than like nutrients and sunlight and all that shit? Exercise, stimulating your brain. I don't know. Maybe every other hour, maybe maybe he's so focused on baseball performance that every other hour is dedicated to the stuff you're talking about. Maybe there's just no like free time. You know what I mean? Maybe it's all outside yeah. sleeping or like eating and stimulating his brain. <laughs> well, I'm going to go he's out not watching TV, he's not eating <laughs> fucking bullshit. He's not going out no. to get drinks with his buddies. He's not, mm-hmm. you know, uh, whatever. Yeah. You know, he's I mean, not if playing you go, canasta. If- He's not rolling doobies. No, no, no. And no. we maybe he is. If it helps with inflammation, thing. maybe maybe that's how he's sleeping help, thirteen help. or fourteen hours. Maybe he's rolling like eight doobies before he goes to <laughs> yeah. bed. Yeah, he might have cracked the code. Where yeah, was this game? Was yeah. it on? Was he on the road? Who where did they play? They're at Yankee Stadium. Dude, New York. You know, suck, actually, yeah. you know they're not letting you smoke up at, at the stadium, bro. No, no. Mm. They're so they won't even let you have a fucking beard. You can, I mean, but in, in New York City, you can walk down the street smoking pot. You can do basically a anything. gun and they're not going to care. Yeah. As long as you didn't kill someone, the cops are not going to do anything about it. Okay. But if you're major, but there's a lot of, hey, there's a lot of paparazzi in New York City. Yeah. So, I want no bur- bur- Yeah, sorry. No, I'm saying you can't smoke on the street because they'll take pictures, put it in the post. That's true. Hmm. Hmm. Then if he has a bad start against the Yankees, then the front page is going to say Kikuchi gets smoked. There you go. <laughs> mm-hmm. What's happened to A-Rod? A-Rod smokes pot? I mean, he just got caught put in the tabloids a lot. And, you know, it kind of affected yeah. his relationship with the fans. And they kind you of... You think that was an accident? You think he didn't want to be seen? No, I think when he went to the Rock with the shirt off, that was just him trying to get mm. some... You know, that was his smoking weed like how kikuchi likes to smoke weed do edibles bong rips fucking tab tabs and all that stuff dabs and all that you know all the shit but yeah uh a rod does steroids and gets natural sunlight next to rocks <laughs> and snitches on his teammates yeah exactly and that's how he became a good player yep but by if- snitching I mean, it helped him. Yeah, that was part of his preparation. And then you get the media involved and they put it out. Oh, look, now everyone hates him for it. It's like, bro, like I could see why maybe a- <laughs> I don't even remember what I was trying to argue or what point I was trying to make. Sorry. But- <laughs> see, why, why you can't be smoking pot. It's the final fumes of the podcast anyway. Yeah. All right. All right. Um, all right, Jay, hey, any final thoughts? I do actually. Um Cubs obviously had an offensive explosion last night after slogging through the previous 10 games. Uh, but shout out to uh, Seiya Suzuki, who, mm. I mean, what what a run he's been on. If you do it since the beginning of August, August 1, he's uh, hitting 347 with a 1.099 OPS. Um, that 1.099 OPS is second among qualified batters in baseball, only to Mookie Betts, and he's first in slugging percentage. If you do it since the beginning of September, he's got a 377 batting average and a 1.204 OPS, which would rank third. Um, he's just been, I mean, I know Bellinger, like in terms of season long contributions, uh, gets most of the credit there. But what Suzuki has done, um, you know, over the last month and a half of the season has been like league leading type of stuff. So shout out to him. That's my final thought. <clears throat> mm. Joseph? Let's just, you know, Kakuna Jr. on the brink of history comes back from the little calf. It was barking. Hits two bombs 
gets his homers up to 39. And now, you know, we were covering the MVP discussion last week. Mookie was getting close. But if you look at it now, offensive statistics, as the page loads, Acuna leads. Acuna and them, and Mookie tied in homers. Acuna leads in, at, leads in average, leads in on-base percentage, tied in slugging, tied WRC+. Plus. The expected WOBA, the stat people should be paying attention to most, yep, mm-hmm. Acuna has the lead by 54 points, not to wow. mention the steals. That's true. Why didn't we give expected WOBA its proper due? <laughs> I mean, as it's a, just a, one as of those a key MVP stat. Yeah, no, you're right. You're right. I mean, f- a fuzzy tweeted it out today. If you look at expected WOBA, Acuna's worst month of expected WOBA this year was better than Mookie Betts' entire season WOBA. Expected that is, WOBA. I'm sure that tweet's wonderful. I just don't think that, and I don't think you do either, but I don't think that matters for MVP. But even if you could say that, and you know what, I respect your opinion. The other stats, we have to take those. No, account. yeah, yeah, yeah. I, my whole my response to this conversation last time is that we are going to need basically every game of the season to make that decision. And uh, Ronald Acuna, since the last podcast, has I think you're cor- correct in saying that he has retaken the lead in terms of who would get the vote for NL MVP. I just I'm not comfortable leaving the final ten or so games on the table either. Yeah, bring it on, Mookie. A Cooney is <laughs> right. <laughs> Mookie versus Cooney. Stop it. It's coming down the wire, but hey, 40-40. That doesn't happen every year, guys. Yeah, I don't I hate that they're calling it 40-40. Like it's 40-70. <laughs> like he's like I, I just saw the the headline this morning. Like, oh, like Ronald Acuna Jr. on the precipice of joining the 40-40 club. It's like, no, no, no. He's about to become the first member of the 40-70 club. Well, like, I don't give a fuck about 40-40 no more. 40-70 is the new mark. And it could be 40-80. No, it can't be 40-80. <laughs> he needs yes, eight, could. 18 more steals in what? Two days? Two weeks? Seven. seven uh, no, 13. Ten, 10 days. 13. 13 yeah. more steals. 10 days. In 11 games. You can do that. Anyways, Jake's takes. Just hope we didn't piss off any Japanese show fans this episode. Yeah. Fuck them. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that, should, that should take care of it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, all right. Uh, we'll see you tomorrow. And we're gone.